and we're live i think hopefully let me guys let me know uh gtsy slav what does gtsy slav mean uh welcome everybody we're gonna give it a couple of minutes welcome joe welcome drew thank you as always for being members supporting the channel hanging out and making everything cool all right, so let's see. Awesome, thank you. All right, I see the numbers starting to come in. Uh, so we're streaming to that stupid book. Uh, we are streaming to YouTube, and we are also on Odyssey. Let me just make sure. Yes, we are. Let me just turn off the volume. Okay, the volume actually looks pretty good, and I have the chat open for that because we don't get those comments in here. Um, yeah, all right. So I got a package here. It's like a couple of days late, uh, but it is from Arkin and I'm kind of excited. Um, we're supposed to be, be here, I think on Thursday. Yeah, it was supposed to be here on Thursday and then I was gonna go uh, put it on a rifle and go to my range on Thursday or Friday. Um, and then Friday I had other plans. I decided to go uh, for a run uh, with my dog and uh, I was wearing my running Adidas shoes and then there's mud. I slipped, hit my head pretty hard, but I think I'm okay. So did not go shoot uh, either yesterday or uh, today. So if you guys notice anything about me, if I start speaking a different language, or Wow, I don't remember that much French anymore. But if I start speaking a different language or a language I'm not supposed to be speaking, do let me know, and that'll be a good sign. Um, so yes, it is Saturday. So um, I know we had an early video on the scope. Um, inside here we have a brand new Arkin EP5. Uh, so uh, with some extra goodies and accessories, so we'll go through it. I was like, I'm like, I, 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 in full fairness, I did open the box to verify what was in there, but um, I didn't play with the scope, I didn't play with any of the accessories or anything else like that, and I was like, okay, you know what? Actually, let's do a live stream out of this, and uh, <laughs> uh, and do this. All right, so I'm not gonna ask you about your noggin, bro, not good. Uh, oh, yeah. I think I'm alright. I'm alright. Uh, I've been taking a lot of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The holistic -y, uh, medicine, so Arnica stuff, and, like, it, it, it's fine. Um, and like I said, and the weird part about that was, is, uh, so as a teen, I did, um, I, uh, I was heavily involved with kickboxing. Um, I mean, I grew up in the ghetto, so I started for self-defense. And then I actually started taking it seriously and competed a lot of matches. So I'm not used to, let me rephrase it, I'm not not used to sparring or able to break a fall or anything. Like I said, this was just stupid. Um, I was running downhill. I stopped short so the dog would run in front of me. Stopped short. Uh, the uh, sneakers did not really have a bunch of traction. So slipped, fell, and didn't really have time to break a fall or anything else like that. So yeah. it is what it is. Uh, but no blood, didn't bust anything. I think I'm all right. All right. Uh, say I love you, my little cabbage in French. Um, je t'aime means I like you a lot, but I don't know the word for cabbage. Je t'aime mon petit something. Well, how about this? Uh, bullets for bucks, je t'aime mon petit uh, baguette. You're my little... French baguette. <laughs> um, evening, Brian. Pleasure seeing you again. All right. Do I think the micro stamping bill will pass? All right. So this is a comment from Facebook. Are you from the NJ Gunforms crowd or the Slav Guns crowd? Because I don't know which one is there, but quick thing on micro stamping. So it's already kind of on the books in Jersey. The problem is 
it's completely stupid if anybody's a gun guy to actually realize this. So micro stamping is on the firing pin. It would stamp like a little serial number or something on it. Uh, what they don't realize is that anybody with a file can just file it down just slightly and it's, it doesn't work. So it is, uh, it's stupid. Uh, now, if we're talking about for New Jersey in particular, I will say that it's going to make a lot of firearms manufacturers leave the state. Um, however, I do think possibly um, it'll force other companies to kind of come in and do something stupid with it. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, so the really funny part is, so and once again, we'll take a couple of questions before we dive into that. So the really funny part about this is in our uh, private Discord group, we were talking about it. So it was a group of 16 of us that went to SHOT Show None of us got sick at SHOT Show, with the exception of uh, Ilya, Dark Lord of Optics. Apparently he got sick with something when he got back, and he's one of those jabbed people. He doesn't actually believe in it, but he needed to for his job. And then Bullets for Bucks got sick, so he's in here, he can kind of tell you his story. But that was a week after SHOT Show, and everyone already got back, so I don't believe it was actually from SHOT Show. Um, I do know at SHOT Show, our point of contact for Palmetto State Armory, he did get sick with COVID, uh, but he was shaking and touching a lot more people than us. And not touching in a, in a bad sense, but um, I actually, so this is a second or third, no, second gear in a row from SHOT Show. Um, don't even have the sniffles or anything else like that, and that's because of all... Anytime you know you're going to go to SHOT Show, you're going to take a whole bunch of multivitamins, wash your hands, just don't be stupid, and uh, you're not going to get sick. Uh, but interestingly, though, um, uh, I guess right before Super Bowl weekend, um, Sisolak, uh, governor of Nevada, they removed the um, mask requirements. I get, but then again, even at SHOT Show, like not, I did not wear a mask 95 96% of the time. Okay, yeah, New Jersey. Um, so it'll be interesting. I think it's going to get overturned. But if actually realize that it's stupid and it's completely unenforceable, it's not going to do anything and it's easily overcome. But New Jersey, what I'm actually more concerned about is New Jersey does have smart gun technology uh, laws on the books. And that's a different story. But uh, that would be more concerning. Especially since at SHOT Show there was one gun which kind of fits that definition. So FFLs would have to carry that gun, even though it sucks. All right. Very cool. All right. Will this guy get on with it? Well, Peter, you can pound sand if you don't like it. Um, we do these live streams. It's combination. What we'll actually do is... Um, I will then chop this video down and we will do it as an actual video instead of just as a live stream. But the live stream, um, it's for channel members, it's for everybody, so we can kind of go with the questions. But also, uh, we usually do give it about five minutes or so for people to start pouring in because we don't often get the notifications on the phone. Um, as we can see right now, there's about 20 people watching live uh, versus when we started, there's only two or three. So that's the reason why we're not going to get started. Uh, but we are going to get started now. So I'm going to go through. We're going to try to and record it in a fashion that I'll be able to then chop it down and make it an actual video. And then we're going to go back and I will answer all of your questions. And then we can uh, chat about this and actually Bullets for Boxer for anybody else watching. If you guys want to pop in later, uh, we'll be able to do that as well. Uh, for the channel members, Joe, Drew, thank you guys for supporting the channel. If you guys want to support the channel and want to see more content like this, hit the join button that's going to be uh, right there. And uh, also as part of a channel member, you get cool perks, you get some swag. Uh, we have member-only live streams. We'll be doing more of those. And also you get discounts to a number of vendors. They're exclusive just to members, uh, one of them being Anarchy Outdoors. You get an additional 10% off everything that they sell, and they'll probably end up selling the scope as well. Uh, or if you just have questions for to support the channel, just hit the super chat button and we'll do that. All right, let me move the laptop a little closer to the camera. Oh, and by the way, I'm recording on my new stupid expensive uh, $3,500 camera. Traded mine in, really excited about it. All right, let me remove this 
and all right this is the first time we're doing this all right what's up everybody welcome squad squad and welcome to slav guns so we are going to be doing an unboxing here today on a product that a lot of you were really interested in and excited about and for me this is also one of those i didn't think i would actually cover it because well let's be honest i am not exactly an arkin fanboy arkin fanboy and have criticized the company and a number of things in the past mainly customer service and inconsistency in quality control uh, fortunately while i was at shot show um I was able to get together with Arkin. I met uh, all three of the owners of Arkin, and I had really good discussions with two out of the three, and actually filmed videos with two out of the three, although you only saw the one with Michael Riley. More, most interestingly to me is that when I came and approached the SHOT Show booth, they were really excited to see me, which I did not think that, that was possible, especially since, once again, I. I think I was a little bit harsh on the company in either case. Uh, but the biggest thing that I got out of it is that despite the criticisms, they're very welcoming and open to having conversations. And I was able to give some recommendations on how Arkin can resolve the issues that I thought they were having. Furthermore, uh, we were able to address some of the questions that I had, namely around quality control and uh, who the OEM is. What I didn't know is that Arkin actually owns their own facility or controls their own facility in China. Now, a US company cannot have a wholly owned subsidiary in China. However, they could partner up with the Chinese company. However, they do have control over this facility and they are working through it. I do consider with older products, it's growing paint. So here, and the biggest announcement that they had at SHOT Show was the Arkin EP5, and I did a video on that scope and an interview, which you can find up here. Yes, that's the correct angle. Um, and then this one, uh, they were able to order me a scope right at SHOT Show, and it did come today, and we're gonna go look through it. So the biggest things I am looking for for the scope is going to be, uh, is the scope, QC there, meaning are there going to be any issues out of the box? Number two is, is this scope in terms of turret feel and fit and finish, if it's going to feel the exact same way as the one that I played with at SHOT Show, and fortunately I still have a pretty good recollection of that. Um, and then just the value that you get with it. Now, one of the things that I really like and what Arkin is doing right now is that they are running a promo, uh, which is if you buy any of our scopes, the EP5 or the SH4 Gen 2, uh, they will include a, uh, I think they call it the precision kit or precision rifle kit, which is about $170, $180 worth of value with a bunch of stuff. Now, when I got the SH4 Gen 2, they had a precision kit, but that was like less stuff. Um, here, they completely loaded it out. So it's a ton of value. Now, my expectations is if this scope is as good as it is, for 550 bucks complete with everything, this is gonna be a major deal and I think it's gonna be the new standard. Because optically and features wise, um, I'm gonna be comparing it to scopes probably in that thousand dollar range. Um, so the biggest one is really gonna be the Vortex Strike Eagle and it's also going to be the um, Element Titan, which is 799 or so, 799 or 899 in the, in the ballpark. Um, I also think this is gonna be very competitive with the Athlon Ares ETR which is the bigger scope, uh, 34 millimeter tube. I think that has like a 1299 or something like that MSRP and or street prices were going to be right in that area. Uh, then on the flip side, we are going to be comparing it with what you get for 500 bucks right now, which is going to be the Vortex Venom. I have the Bushnell Match Pro and uh, obviously the Arkin SH4 Gen 2, which is 449. Now, one of the scopes that I really, really, really like, but I think it's going to be completely outclassed at that $500 price point right now is going to be the, uh, the Element Helix front focal plane, which I have a couple of them, uh, but it's still a 30 millimeter tube. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more limited, so it'll be interesting. All right, 
So let's get on with this. Uh, I did open it in full fairness. So I did open it. I just to verify that everything was in here. Uh, however, I did not play with any of this stuff. Uh, scope wise, I mean, it does come packaged. Uh, UPS is pretty horrible right now. Um, it was two or three days late. However, uh, I have a package from UPS, which is about a week late now. Right, let me grab a drink. All right, so packing slip. Oh, 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 and in full fair and in full disclosure. So this scope uh, is a testing and evaluation sample. It was ordered for me at SHOT Show. Um, I did not uh, pay for the scope. However, I waited in line with everybody else. Nor do I believe that this scope was cherry picked for me because they haven't in the past. Um, and when I did briefly open the box, everything was still sealed. There was absolutely zero signs of any molestation. Uh, the only scope that I do know, the only scope that I do know which possibly was cherry picked by Aflon was the one that was sent to Ilya, Dark Lord of Optics. And that was because that scope came to him not from Arkin, but from a third party. So keep that in mind. However, uh, this is the fourth Arkin scope that's being sent to me. Uh, so the first one was the Arkin SH4 Gen 1, which was meant for Alex at Affordable Optics and Rifle Reviews. And when I got that scope, it was all right. Um, and then I sent it to him, and by the time he got there during transit, the turrets, I believe, seized up or there were some parallax issues. Uh, then I got the first SH4 Gen 2, which again was meant for Alex Affordable Optics, and that's the one I did the videos with. Um, it was fine. Uh, then I got the second SH4 Gen 2, which is on my rifle there. Um, it's fine as well, except there's a small nick inside the eyepiece, and, but it doesn't impact functionality in any way. So this is number four, which is the Arkin EP5. And in terms of uh, within the Arkin product lineup, this is the third scope that they're releasing. So when they started the company, they released the Arkin SH4 Gen 1 and Arkin, SA, Arkin EP4. Um, basically, one was Japanese ED glass. It was a little bit better. The other one was the cheaper one. It was the SH4 Gen 2, Gen 1, which was still a really good value for what it was. However, for SH4 Gen 2, I do believe that they, that's when they switched the OEMs to their own OEM and uh, vastly different design, a lot more features. And when the SH4 Gen 2 came out, they kind of stopped producing the EP4. So now they have the SH4 Gen 2, and then now this is the new EP5, which is kind of like, it looks very similar to an SH4 Gen 2, however, upgraded, and we'll talk about that. So, ooh. So this is really, really cool. Uh, so this is part of the precision pack and you get goodies inside. You have a set of her scope rings, which are the, I guess we call them the halo ones. Very nice scope rings for the money and I've recommended them in the past. I think they're about 50 or 60 bucks. Uh, fantastic scope rings and these are 34 millimeter because that's what the scope is. And then this is something new, uh, flip it covers. Um, so I did play with these at SHOT Show. This is the first time I have them. They do have an Arkin logo on them. And then we do have the Arkin SH4 box, which was a little bent up. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, go through the precision pack because I do think you get a lot of value with it first. Um, number one, you get a set of scope rings. They do have three different sizes. I went with, I believe these are the medium ones, uh, one, one and a quarter inches. And um, this is gonna go on a bolt gun. It's not gonna go on an AR rifle. So that's why we went with those. Uh, what I do like about them, Torx rings. Uh, you do get two extra, I'm sorry, Torx screws. You get two extra Torx screws. You get the um, Torx wrench, although just use your own fix-it sticks kit. 
Um, lifetime warranty on the rings, uh, T6 aluminum, they do look really, really solid. Um, if you have an AR and you need an actual one-piece mount, they do have those bases as well, which are quite nice. Uh, lens covers. Oh, okay, you do get both. Okay, so that's the back one. That's the front one. Um, rubber, so it just kind of goes right around the bell housing. Spring-loaded. Says Arkin on them. Cool. Um, the one thing I'll say is they definitely improved the packaging and all of this stuff, so... They're almost like a real company. <laughs> Not sure if that comment is going to be kept in there. Um, oh, in the back one, same thing. It's rubber. It's a little tight. There we go. And it's cool. Um... I'm not sure if I'm going to use those. I'll, I do like a bikini cover. Um, a little thick around the edges. Um, now, what's really cool at SHOT Show, we were playing with um, the aluminum ones on the uh, on the Hawk Scopes, and those were nice. So if you can get those, that would be really, really awesome. All right, and then inside this bag, so this is the first time we're actually doing this. Before, it just used to be like a couple of things just like thrown in the box. Um, so this is the sandbag, or as I call it, it's the brass pickup bag. <laughs> I like it. Um, so this is, I guess, the second one. I have one over there. You could fill it with sand. There's a zipper on top, and you can use it as a bag, as a rear bag. Although I do like this for, I think as a rear bag, it's going to kind of suck. But it's really, really cool to pick up brass or anything else or just store it on your bag as a utility bag okay throw lever uh, once again nicely packaged before just came in a bag before so i believe this one yeah so sh4 gen 3 so it'll also work on this one because it's the same eyepiece um, aluminum there's one screw on there i just unscrewed put it around um, very very nice now i do wish that hopefully for future ones they would just integrate like a shark fin or fro lever in there uh, versus using these but this is better than nothing all right and then we have an arkin patch yay who wants an arkin patch i'm not a patch person and a bubble level now these are really 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 cool um so i have um on one of the other ones nice translucent it's really nice um so it's a good value so the fact that basically uh when you're getting stuff you would need this i think with most scopes you would need this yeah maybe um it's a really good value the fact that you kind of get this for free so they have $179 value on all of the stuff. So let's call it 50 bucks for the rings. A good fro lever, let's say 15 to 20, 70. Uh, bubble level. Um, if you're serious about precision, you're going to want to buy one. I would probably, I mean, I've seen a couple of them for like 30 bucks. So let's say this is going to be 40. Uh, so that's like 110, 120. And then flip caps i'm not sure if you're going to use them or not or get something else so even if you don't use these um, you're getting in 100 bucks of value on there so if you're buying the scope it's 550 take away 100 bucks and stuff that you're going to need or want um really solid value um, that we're starting with i think for 450 it's going to be unbeatable oh yeah and there's the bag all right so now let's play with the scope um please don't suck Alright. Styrofoam. Arkin sticker. Let me know who wants one. Manual. What's here? And the scope. So in here, okay, we have a Allen wrench, I guess, for resetting the zero stop. And we have an Arkin cleaning cloth. And I believe last time they were gray. So white is interesting. All right. And then we actually have this. Well, actually, is it in English? 
such a bad joke. Okay, so the scope definitely is made in China. Uh, a lot of the Chinese stuff that you buy has like a manual that's not even in English, but it's horrible. Um, so the manual is only like six pages, uh, but it does tell you everything about setting the zero stop and it is specific to the EP5, which is nice. We'll go through it later. All right, so scope wise. All right. Look, another Arkin sticker. All right, it looks exactly as it's supposed to on, on the last uh, What's nice is like this. So even if you don't get the precision pack, you do get the bikini scope covers, which I do prefer and I do like. All right. Um, as with most Arkin packaging, I think I've seen this most of the time, you do get a sunshade and it is put over the rear eyepiece and you do get that. Nothing else in the box. Let's see, is there a check inside? Nope, nothing in here. Ah, crap. All right, um, let me find out why this happened. Give me one second, guys. One second. All right, that was so weird. Uh, it's a new camera, I don't have the settings on there. I don't know why it shut off. It is possibly, I wonder if it is, uh... I wonder if it's because, I mean, I have the heat set, overheat setting set on high, so that was weird. Okay, we'll keep an eye on it, but like I said, don't, if something happens, just let me, I'll keep an, I'll keep an eye on it. Camera is out, boss. Yes, uh, we're we're good now. Um, was that actually thirty minutes? Actually, it might have been thirty minutes if there is a record limit on there. All right, that was weird. Okay, so going back to the scope, uh, it's a big, big monster. Oh, what was I showing you? There is no paycheck. In, there is no check inside the box. Sorry, self-deprecating humor. Now, one thing I really, really do like about Arkin is that both on the scope rings and on the scope, it'll actually tell you, hey, look, it focuses. Oh, there's the, uh, it'll tell you what the torque specifications are so you don't have to guess. And same thing on the torque ring. So on the torque rings, it tells you 30 inch pounds for the screws on the bottom and then right on top it says 18 inch pound so you can't screw it up uh, do get a proper torque wrench do get a good uh, torque limiter or screw set uh, all right i'll keep that on there for now all right everything's nice and big so uh, let's talk over the features and we'll kind of go through it on the back uh, you're going to have the what's the word i'm looking for uh, fast focus eyepiece. So this is going to be the first thing that you set for your eyes, whether you shoot with glasses or not. Adjustment is nice and smooth. It was a little tight when it was all the way in there, but when you spin it out, it's super smooth. No issues. Uh, you have a little beveling on here, which is pretty nice. Very cool. All right, uh, magnification adjustment ring. This is a five power, five to 25. Fairly tight. There's like a little bit of, like you can feel a little bit of rubbing, but it's still new. Uh, but fair, nice and tight, pretty smooth. No grinding, which is a big thing. Um, I played with, at SHOT Show, we played with the UTG Integric scopes, which are like $1,600 scopes. And two out of the three, like the magnification ring, it was just grinding. Now, definitely there's no shark fins or anything else on here. However, you do have a channel here cut, which is where you would put the fro lever. Um, 
The fro lever is also going to be fine. Uh, before you lock the fro lever down, you do want to run it. Uh, you do want to put it on the gun and have the um, bolt open and run it to make sure that you are not going to be hitting the fro lever with your hand uh, when you're running the bolt. Um, not bad. All right. Uh, moment of truth. Turrets. Yeah. Very nice. Um, they feel very much like the SH-4 Gen 2. Nice, uh, big. Uh, you do have two sets of numbers for which turn you're on. And then also here, if you do run it all the way out, right on here, it is uh, going to show which rotation you're on. Sharp, tactile. We're not bad. Um, now, obviously, as you can hear it, like I just overran, like you just did two clicks instead of one. Like you, you just have, so you do have to be a little bit more careful, but because the turrets are so thick, you can kind of get there. Okay, so you guys are hearing that, right? I'm just like a ASMR. Um, yeah. So, definitely not bad. I think for this price point, these are... So... Damn it, I can't show it in this one. Uh, all of my high-end scopes are on guns, and because we're doing this as part of a live stream, I can't compare them. But I will do it when we actually do the actual video. We'll have it in there. Um, I guess I'll do this. Okay. So this here is the Aflon Cronus BTR, BTR Gen 2, which we'll have a video on very, very soon. Uh, that's a $1,500 scope. Once again, like they're very sharp, but... You can get in that one click if you wanted to get into it. If you go fast here, it's like it doesn't almost like stop. Okay, here we go. Great way. If, it doesn't stop on a dime, but it's still not bad. So if you have an SH4 Gen 2 or played with one, uh, that's exactly what you're gonna get. Uh, since we have it here, we have the Bushnell Match Pro. We have locking turrets on this one. And these turrets are pretty good. Looks like it's much smaller. I mean, you can kind of see a comparison. And these are $50 apart. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't have any other scopes here that are not on guns. No, I don't. Okay. Uh, so, not bad. Uh, it's not a 2000, it's not a loophole Mark V. It's not a higher on Burris, it's not an Athlon Cronus or Tract, uh, but this is also a $550 scope, and for that price, these are fantastic. All right, windage. Feels a little bit different. Once again, you can kind of hear, sometimes like it'll run over two, instead of you trying to put just one. But if you slow it down, you can you can get it. All right. But once again, these are super big, uh, so it's going to be very easy to maneuver those. Uh, okay, so to reset the zero, undo the cap, turn it, and you can set it. Uh, when you're setting the zero stop, you mess with that, and you can do it. We'll do it in the full video. All right, uh, parallax. This is super smooth. Uh, this is, I think, the smoothest on an Arcan I've played with. Um, so here, 
It's from 25 out to infinity. Uh, very nice. Okay, and then illumination. It's like a nice bumpy click. And it's actually big enough. Now what's actually nice is that it is on, off, on, off. So you don't have like 10 settings of on and then you can get it. Well, let's say you'll have to tighten this up a little bit when you put the battery cap. Actually, remind me, where's the battery? Is it in here already? There's no battery in there. Aw, shit. Okay, you, you can uh, keynote this. My scope did not, there's a major Arkin issue. Uh, there's no batteries with the scope. At least I don't see them. Uh, oh, wait, no, never mind. They're inside the bag. Um, yeah, there's one bag. Yeah, that's actually weird. So it wasn't in the box from the scope. It was inside the extras pack. Okay. Uh, CR 2032 battery. Drop it in. Contacts look good. Nice smooth threads. Uh, what I will say is, so you know how like on some of them, you have like, oh crap, a facial record of uh, face detect on, there you go. So you have that slot in there so you can unscrew the battery cap. You don't actually have it on here. It's an Arkin logo. So... Don't over tighten this cap because you might have issues. Okay. All right, so let's actually look at the scope and the reticle. Oh, wow, the, the field of view is super wide. Okay. Uh, let's turn the illumination on high. Okay. Um, so this scope, it doesn't have... I'll throw it up on here in a little bit. Okay. Um, that is weird. Okay. I think it's because the camera's overheating. Give me one second. I'm right here. So what I'm doing is I'm actually just changing the setting because I have it streaming out in 4K. So let me just change the this auto. All right, let's try that again. First live stream with a $4,000 camera. Okay, it's not actually that bad. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I just got the, I upgraded to the Sony A7i, the A7 IV. And with the other one, I didn't have any issues, but I still did not go through all the settings. It seems like the camera's overheating and it turns it off. All right, so let's go back through this. And somebody remind me, what the heck were we talking about? Peter, if you don't like if you don't like the show, change the channel. This was in regards to this comment. And this is a live stream and not a prepared video. Alright, um. Okay, so the reticle on here. And I guess the only 
thing I can give him crap for is at 550 bucks, there are other scopes that when they do have an illuminated reticle, it's the entire reticle is illuminated or more of it. On here, the only thing that's illuminated is the center crosshair. Uh, that's the only thing that's illuminated on here. Now, personally, I am not a huge fan of illumination, nor do I actually use it that much. Um, however, I understand the reasoning behind it. Um, so one of the things that kind of gets brought up is going to be the illumination, on, like the level of illumination on the reticle, I guess the crosshair. So there's six settings. I have it on the highest, on sixth. And I have it on... So let's turn it up to 20 or 25 magnification. Um, obviously in the dark, it's going to be super bright. I'm looking at one of the lights in front of me. Yeah, you definitely can't see it. Um, I think it's going to be usable in the daytime. I do think it's going to be usable in the daytime, um, especially if you're looking against like a dark target. But it's uh, there's some scopes that have like a true daytime illuminated reticle. I don't think this is it. But then again, it's 550 bucks. Um, so it is there. Um, all right. Now, I can't tell much about the image quality, especially since I have the lights turned off everywhere around me. Um, magnification ring is super smooth. It is not bad. I do like the reticle. It's fairly clean. So, I mean, it's a true Christmas tree style reticle that goes to, you have 12 mils of holdover. And you have five mils of hold unders. Actually, let me do this since I'm gonna edit this. Uh, just so you guys know what I'm talking about, let me actually pull it up and I'll share it on the screen. Arkin. And it is, uh, and obviously the links for all of these are in the description. Yeah, so for the rings are 60 bucks on their website and I do think they're worth it. All right, uh, let me get a picture of the reticle. I am going to open it in a new tab so it's nice and big. Then we're gonna go back in here. I'm gonna share. Screen. All right, we're going to open up a tab. All right, and there it is. All right, so can you guys see it on there? I know it might not be huge. All right, but that's the reticle. So it's not a, I mean, this really is a Christmas tree style reticle. Um, it goes, yeah, so the, I mean the holdovers, it's, it's two mils of holdovers, oh, sorry, it's two mils of windage holdovers at one mil then once again two at two actually it, it's uh one two two one two three four five yeah and it kind of goes from there it's not bad um it's a very usable radical now uh one of the things that kind of gets brought up is and it's totally personal preference whether you like a center dot or you like a center crosshair. I'm definitely a center tiny small dot person myself. 
and this does have it. Um, I think the Burris SCR2 reticle is still going to be my preference, but this is definitely usable. Uh, it's usable. And once again, you have 12 mils of holdover. Uh, it doesn't just like stop at 10 or whatnot. And as you go further down, it's there. The hold unders are also not bad, um, especially if you have a scope that's like a, uh, let's say if you have a 30 or 40 MOA base. So with a 30 MOA base, you should have no issues um, zeroing the scope because we have what, 32 mils of internal elevation adjustment on here. And um, you won't have any issues getting it zeroed. Um, but if you want to maximize it with a 30 or 40, you can actually zero it at, let's say, 300. And for 100, you can actually use the hold unders um, if that's the route that you wanted to go. Um, overall, it's actually very, very, very not bad. Um, I definitely, I mean, the fit, the color on here is a little bit darker than the SH4 Gen 2, uh, but otherwise, the fit and feel on it is not bad. Actually, one of the things we were looking at, uh, somebody was asking about the eye relief. Actually, give me one second, guys. I'm going to turn the lights on back there so I can actually get a better image. much better okay so one of the things uh, one comment that I had was oh, wrong button um, and I'm gonna go back right through the comments and all of this stuff there we go um, so one question and comment that I had that popped up was the eye relief on here so in my opinion from what I recall the child show is that this was a decent eye box and you had decent amount of eye relief. Um, somebody commented that they already had the scope and it was a little bit on a smaller side. So yes, generally Arkin scopes, you have nice field of view, but the eye box is not going to be as forgiving as the Vortex uh, Venom and the Strike Eagle. So let's see here. Uh, actually, I'll turn this way too so you guys can see. Okay. So here I have, so I am on 12 power, where you can see most of the reticle. A little bit on the tighter side, but it's totally usable. Okay, and let's crank it up to 25. Okay, yeah. Right here, I can see the entire reticle in full view. If I go in any direction, it is a little bit tighter. So, yes, it's a it it's just I would say it's like the SH4 Gen 2. It's almost identical to it. It's not bad. It's totally usable, but it is. You got to get a. You got to work on your position. You got to make sure you're staying in that position because if you go in any direction, um, you might quickly get out of it. So, but then again, you shouldn't be cracked up on 25 power anyway. Um, I think 16, I would honestly say even like 12 on here looks really good. So there you go. All right, so those are my first impressions. And now we're gonna go through this. Uh, let's go through the questions and comments that you guys had. Do, 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 do. All right, so I'm going to start from this point and go back up over the questions. Sorry, got called in for work. Okay, eye relief. Yeah, 3.4, 3 3.5 inches seems uh, pretty good. Oops, can't go wrong. Um, don't know what that was, but yeah. Like I said, for the money, I think it's a really good value. Okay. Is it safe to assume this reticle is more a hunting ri rifle reticle and not for long-range PRS or ELR? I think this is a perfect reticle for PRS or ELR. 
uh, depending on the type of shooting that you're doing. Um, I think it's totally usable. So uh, most of them, I think even like the LM, uh, damn it, it's mounted. My Titans, all of them are mounted on guns. Uh, but we, I'll actually have, in the video, I have the adap new adapters that go onto this. So I'll, we'll have plenty of through the scope footage with this. Um, it's just a different type of uh, Christmas tree style reticle. Um, I think it's not bad. Uh, most of the people that I know are going to just click and they're just going to dial in what they need to. Uh, personally, unless I'm shooting at that particular distance the entire day, I actually generally just hold over. Um, I like it zeroed in at 100 and then I'll hold over and I usually have no issues um, holding over out to six, seven, eight hundred yards instead of just messing and dialing it in. Um, that's my take on it. A lot of people, they'll just dial in for every single little thing. Um, um, the SCR2, I believe, has up to 18 mils of holdover within the reticle uh, versus here we have 12. Um, some have only 10, so it's not bad. I think it's totally fine for it. Um, it's nice and clean. And for ELR, so even if we have 25 power, because you have that nice thin center dot, it's going to be just fine for targets. Um, I think if you had a center crosshair, it would be less appropriate for ELR because the targets are going to be smaller and that crosshair can just basically cover the entire target. Um, however, I like a small, thin center dot. I would say it could possibly go even thinner. Um, actually, but what is the center dot? Let's see. It's in, it should be in the manual, which is... There it is. The center dot on here is... Do, 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 do. Oh, come on, guys. It is not in here, um, possibly on the website. But I think the center got. I think the center dot could be a little bit lighter, smaller, thinner. Uh, but I mean, the reticle is totally usable at 25 power. If that's how you roll, totally usable at 25. Um, I think right around. Yeah, I think 16 looks really good because you can you can see 12 mils of holdover still. And you still have your hold unders. And I know because people ask high power, it's still usable. Uh, I think it's still usable to get five power. But again, it's, a, it's only a five timer return, so it's not that bad. Uh, the scopes that are going to have it bad are, let's say, the one to eight or one to ten LBPOs. Because then you're really making the choice between too thick um, at the high magnifications and you or too useless at the low, um, and also the new eight power, uh, the new eight magnification range scopes coming out from uh, Japan, which would be, uh, I mean, even kind of like the track. They have the new, I think the new right on, the new Bushnell. Um, couple others so that's a four and a half to 27 and that one is actually just gonna be still fine uh, the one I'm thinking of is the crimson trace they had a four to tw uh, four to 32 and uh, I'm sorry no, it was a three to 24 and it was basically almost useless on low magnification right? but the reticles on there just kind of sucked um, now also as far as the reticles this is the only reticle that's gonna be available with the scope right now uh, but I think for the type of people who are buying this, this is going to be just fine. All right, so hopefully that answered that, Drew. Yep, uh, my Viper has illumination, looks nice, but I haven't needed it yet. So, I mean, that's the thing with illumination. Like I said, I have a friend of mine who won't even look at scopes unless it has illumination. Um, it, is useful, it is useful if you have 
I guess I would say probably for like F class or you're shooting a larger target, which is completely dark. Let's say if it's a black uh, bullseye, illumination is going to help because you can actually see um, the reticle against the crosshairs. That's where it's really going to be helpful. Um, and then also if you're shooting at dusk or dawn. Uh, for hunting, I don't know. I'm not a hunter, but we'll bring on uh, uh, Stephen Bullets for Bucks and he can talk about that in a little bit. Okay. I have two of these scopes. Trust me, you can go wrong. Can't you, I'm assuming you meant can't go wrong. Uh, but then again, I'm the one who hit my head. Uh, they are not lightweight though. That's actually very true. Um, this is a heavy scope. It is 39 ounces. So it's it's up there in weight, uh, much like right around the same weight as the Titan. Um, so for hunting, I don't think these are gonna be great. If, if your mantra ounces is pounds, uh, then don't look at this. It's over two pounds. Uh, but um, if you're going for a range gun or a target gun, extra weight is gonna only going to help you reduce recoil. So, <laughs> um, like I said, the big thing with Arkin is that they're, look, for the value and for the money, you can't pack any more features in for the price point. So 56, 34 millimeter to 32 mils of internal elevation adjustment, nice smooth adjustments, very, very nice turrets, um, Japanese ED glass. So this is the big difference versus the SH4 Gen 2. Um, ED Japanese glass, there's more of it. That's why it is uh, more expensive. And it's a 56 millimeter objective versus a 50 millimeter on the SH4 Gen 2. So. It is bigger. I mean, it's a blown up SH4 Gen 2. Um, okay. Radical. Oh, it's huge. Okay. Uh, Drew had a question. Does it come with a daylight tube? Yes, it does come with a sunshade. Um, let's actually just throw it on. Okay. Threads are smooth. I have no complaints. There we go. That is the scope with the sunshade on there. The finish on the sunshade looks a little different from the one on the scope. Like this is more black. This I think look look this would match perfectly on the SH4 Gen 2. So like I said, there's a little bit of a color tone that I picked up. Um, this matches that. This is a little bit darker black finish. All right, uh, and to show the brightness. Uh, so to show the brightness, we will absolutely have it in the review video. <laughs> and uh, there is... Um, Steven giving me a hard time. A kitchen, uh, a cooking channel talking about food. I'm hungry again. Okay, uh, reticle choices. So there's only one reticle and it's the one that I showed. It is absolutely a lot of scope for the money. Uh, we talked about the value on it. It is really good some slick ASMR. I will absolutely probably, you know what? That would be a really good idea for somebody to do a video of hours of just somebody dialing in a scope. And then we'll have a game for who can pick out which turrets it is just by the sound of it. Like I said, these are nice and big. Uh, they're solid turrets. Really, really solid turrets for the money. Uh, all right, Arkin's best scope for the money. Okay, so kind of go back to this question. So, and Jesus, Drew, you have a lot of questions. <laughs> all right, um, so my most popular video, we've done the review videos on SH4 Gen 2. Uh, the big one, 
is the SH4 Gen 2 versus the Vortex Venom. For most people, so even though the SH4 Gen 2, oh, this is the, EP4, this is the EP5, even though the SH4 Gen 2 has more features and more internal elevation adjustment, I still gave the edge in terms of image quality to the Vortex Venom, and for most people, I think that would be a better scope because it comes from Vortex. Uh, it's not to say that Vortex has any less issues uh, versus Arkin, but there are five different ways you can get in touch with Vortex, and they will absolutely stand behind the company. They will make it right. Um, Arkin is a company that is keeping other optics companies very honest, because think of it, five years ago, we did not have this much features for 550 bucks not even close um you it'd be at least a thousand bucks in order to get there at the price point so now you have the sh4 gen 2 which is 470 449 and you still get all of the extras with that one as well and then you have the ep5 which is 549 and you get all of these extras so even if you back those out it's 350 and 450 uh because you'd end up needing to get scope rings and all of that stuff anyway it's unparalleled. I mean, it's completely insane the value that you're getting for the money. Uh, before this, and if my friend Derek was here in Northwest Guns, he can talk about the Blackhound Genesis, which also, I mean, we're the one the first to kind of come up with the scope is going to come with a set of rings, it's going to come with a sunshade, uh, scope caps, and all of that stuff. But the scope wasn't as good. Um, it definitely was not as good. It's still a 30 millimeter tube. It was it was kind of lacking on the internal elevation adjustment. Is only like 18 or 19 mils versus 32. Um, this is the SH4 and this are the scopes that would be there for long range 22s and for ELR shooting. It's tough to beat them. But you just got to make sure that you know that Arkin is a newer company. Uh, but they are hopefully going to act on a couple of recommendations I gave on the QC and the customer service side, more importantly. Um, aluminum scope covers are sexy, but I'd be afraid to snag one. Yes. Uh, best rings for the money. Okay, so this is a handgun question. Any thought on the new freight train and what do you think their goal was? Um, it's Smith. I haven't played with it. I, I don't know. I wouldn't, personally. <laughs> Slow down on the vodka. Yes, I do get excited. And I don't drink vodka. I am a wine snob. All right. William Scott, new subscriber, was wondering what your Slav heritage is. I was born in the former Soviet Union, and more particularly, I was born in Ukraine. Um, came over here when I was nine years old, but more specifically, um, I'm one of those ethnic Russian-speaking Ukrainians. I understand Ukrainian, but I don't speak a word of it. Except, that means I do not understand Ukrainian language. Um... Okay. And I think we're gonna go through to answer those. Okay, here's a question. Um, is this Japanese glass and the rest of the scope comes from and is assembled in China? Yes. Um, Arkin, uh, they're an American company. They, I guess, have some sort of a joint partnership in China and uh, they control that OEM. I believe one of the owners of Arkin is the owner of the OEM. Um, so they basically design everything in-house and they source the glass from Japan. For the EP5, they source the glass from Japan. It is Japanese ED glass. So 
HD is a marketing term. There is no standard for that. However, the R stands for ED or extra low dispersion glass. There are standards for that. Um, that's the big upgrade in the scope. Um, there's some other components that they do buy, uh, but they do design and then they produce, the, they assemble it in China in their own OEM. And I will have a link. Um, if you're watching this in replay, it'll be linked up here. Or go back for my recent videos. I think in about a week ago, it was the SHOT Show uh, Arc and Booth Tour where we talked with one of the owners and they addressed that in particular. Okay. Uh, okay, I will, let me actually do this now. I will send a link to Bullets for Bucks. Invite guests, copy link. It is... Okay, hold on, it's loading there. It is there. Okay, I sent you the link. All right. All right. Uh, does the front objective scope cover fit snug on the sunshade as it does on the sun? Okay, uh, no, so the outer diameter on the sunshade is exactly the same as the scope, so you shouldn't have any issues. And even though this is a 56 millimeter, the sunshade on here, from what I'm reading, is it fits objective lenses 60 to 65, so there shouldn't be any issues uh, getting it on there. Um, I think... I had similar scope caps, I think, for Monstrum, and they fit, fit, fit fine. Did you buy the scope, or is it commissioned? Uh, they sent me this scope for testing and evaluation. I did not buy the scope. Um, however, I don't think it was cherry-picked. And I did not get a check to talk about it. Um, so, I guess kind of going back to the other question. Uh, there's a lot of this stuff going on. Um, once you, if you're watching a video from, let's put it this way, if you're watching a video from any content creator, no matter the size, ask yourself the question, what is the relationship between the content creator and the company? I don't have an issue with people getting paychecks to talk about a product as long as they disclose it so that you know what I to keep it out in front of. Um, that's why in all of my review videos, uh, within the first 60 seconds, you will see a screen uh, where right after the timeline for the video, there will be a pros and cons screen. And on the bottom, it tells you disclosure. And I tell you what my relationship is with the company, uh, whether I purchased the product, whether the product was sent to me or, and I haven't had that yet, whether the product was sent to me and I got a check. Uh, for gun related it for gun related things I did not have anybody actually send me a check nor would I actually do that the reason why is if the company is going to be paying you to make a sponsored video um, generally they're gonna get the right of first refusal or we're gonna say fine if we're gonna send you a check um, before you publish the video, we want to look over it. And I don't do that, not for review. I, I would not be able to do that. Um, but I would accept a scope and I just disclose that fact that that's what it is. Um, that's what it is. Um, it's the same thing. So, I mean, even, and it's no different on YouTube uh, versus magazines and I think magazines it's even even worse because if you want to be on a cover of a magazine or you want to be voted best of the year um, all it takes is about five thousand dollars in advertising and you can fi about five thousand dollars in advertising and your scope or your gun can win the best of and the worst example of it was I was chatting with um, I was at Barnes and Nobles, I was looking at, I think it was Recoil or Ballistic Magazine, and they had the best of, and like one of them was a category for like precision rifles. And there was like two guns that were rated like very, very poorly. And the ones that won were like guns that cost three times as much. 
that would attract to like very, very few people. Uh, but meanwhile, you scroll a few pages and there is like full page ads on those guns. Um, and then I contacted one of the companies whose gun didn't win. I'm like, hey, um, I thought your gun would actually be one of the best values in this category. And I know when I shoot it, it's like a sub half MOA gun. Uh, wonder why I didn't win it. And the answer was, we don't pay for advertising. <laughs> so you have a lot of that. Um, unfortunately, they generally don't actually have to disclose it, uh, but that's the relationship on there. Um, if you're talking about Arkin, um, as far as I know, they don't send checks to people to talk positively about their products. Uh, but there are some content creators who make a lot of money with the affiliate programs for some of the companies. And it's a pretty high commission, let's put it that way. Um, it does help support the channel, especially because a lot of them, you're not, it's a lot of cost to come out and actually do a review. Um, and it's, and the person should be compensated. Like I said, my biggest issue is that people don't disclose the relationship. I think you guys are smart enough to decide for yourself. Um, I just wish more creators would actually disclose it and like I do. So um, that was the one thing that I did completely from the start and that's my um, take on it. And let, let me know your thoughts on it. All right, uh, Steven, I, let me, uh, give me a thumbs up when you're ready. Okay, I'll bring you on in just a second. Let me just kind of go through this real quick. Um, yep, spot on. It's big and heavy, but for the... All right, okay. So I got to address this one. Uh, I think the glass is better than the Vortex. Um, if you're talking about the SH-4, it's not. Um, if you're talking about the e EP-5, probably is and it should be um i've looked for both i've talked to a couple other people who who have a number of them the venom versus the e, uh, sh4 the venom was sharper in the center and like 80 or 90 percent of it um edge to edge the SH4 Gen 2 was a little bit more consistent, uh, but the Venom was actually sharper, higher contrast, uh, less chromatic aberrations. Um, the Vortex Venom is a different OEM from the Strike Eagle. The Venom, the biggest limitation on that scope is there's no illumination and it's limited to the internal elevation adjustment. But if you don't need those, it was notwithstanding this, uh, but that was my go-to in that price range. Um, now, the people who say otherwise, uh, one openly hates Vortex, and he'll tell you that. And they, I actually did video clips so you can see them side by side instead of just taking an image. Um, the thing that you guys got to understand is that when you're taking through the scope footage, having the camera off slightly is going to make a big difference because you need to adjust the focus, you need to adjust the parallax in the scope, plus you need to make sure that the phone or the camera has the proper focus set. And it also matters what kind of camera you're recording with because a lot of the image quality is gonna get lost through not only the glass in the scope, but also the glass in the camera. Um, so ultimately it's find the person that you trust to be able to see it with your own eyes in a variety of conditions, and then better yet, look through it yourself if you get that opportunity to do it. Um, but I mean, it's, like, it's not that I'm saying that the, EP, the SH4 is bad, it's not. I mean, we're talking about the best and second best in the price category. Uh, I mean, literally, it's almost splitting hairs, but um, the people out there, and I don't have a problem with Joe, I think Cyclops Joe's a really, really, really nice guy. Uh, I think he's an knowledgeable guy. There's just somebody else who was there who's just like, uh, people who think that the SH4, okay, I promise you, there'll probably be videos that basically say, oh, this is a $550 scope. You don't need to spend 1500 bucks on a Aflon Cronus. You don't need to spend uh, $2,000 on a uh, Leupold Mark V. You don't need to spend it on a Track Torque. 
No, uh, there's still a difference. I mean, you might be splitting hairs a little bit more, uh, but as we saw with the turrets, these are really, really nice for the money, can't be beat for the money, but even like compared to the Cronus, there's a difference. There's a difference. Um, there's definitely a difference, but we will absolutely be comparing them side by side to stand up. But in that, I would say probably up to a thousand bucks, I think this is going to be very tough to beat. All right, so let me put this on. I'm going to bring in bullets for bucks. All right. Uh, hello there, kind sir. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Is it is it good? Right. Does it sound good? <laughs> you are good. It sounds good. All right. All right. Uh, do you think that the fact that the reticle is not fully illuminated is a downfall? All right. <clears throat> Great question. Um, so, reticle question, and I know you're a hunter guy, so let me answer this, and then I want your take on this. So, the fact that here we just have illuminated center crosshair, is it a downfall? To me, no, because I generally don't use illumination anyway. Uh, but do you need, what's your take on illumination in a scope, I guess for either for just a personal preference and then also would it be needed for hunting? Um, I think that a lot of hunters like a fire dot, like just a, uh, the illuminated dot, or maybe just the, the main two crosshairs because they don't want the extra cl clutter, but more than that, like if it's low light conditions and you're aiming and you're looking at something that ha is darker in color, has fur on it or whatnot, um, and it's, it's low light, your eye is going to dilate maybe to the reticle and then you're okay. not going to be able to see what you're actually shooting at. Um, so too much illumination, I think, is bad kind of for hunting. Okay. But uh, I, I, have, I have hunted without illumination with it and you can do it either way, really. Uh, is it nice to maybe have like a fire dot? Sure. Um, the the reason i was saying no 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 for the hunting was what i meant like and i am in a i'm in a facetious mood tonight but what i what i meant apparently that's my mood all the time talking to well, some creators <laughs> I, I i don't think it usually is for me but i guess i've been sick for two weeks and i'm all kinds of medication so it's it's maybe i'm i'm a little high on that i guess but uh um like the the scope is obviously way heavy way bulky and way 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 more than you'll ever need for hunting and it's not really purposely designed for hunting so to say that the reticle is designed for hunting it would be i guess it'd be really stupid on their part if they made it that way i don't think that's what their intended purpose was though but, i mean generally um, most hunters are not going to use a tree style reticle anyway i mean we're going to go center cross at least on the east coast because you're not going to be hunting past 300 yards anyway there's a there's a lot of western hunters that use yeah. um more of a tree style they tend to maybe gravitate more to where you just have hash marks and holdovers for your elevation okay. and windage but not the christmas tree style that comes out with your windage markings um if that makes sense um but of course you got a variety of, of argument on there but it's, it's not super uncommon in western hunting i mean um isn't it i i well i have the vortex lht both of them and now I'm, now I'm trying to remember. I know one reticle is different actually from the other. I think one of them might have the Christmas tree style and the other one might not. I could okay. be wrong there. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly that scope is is not the right scope for hunting. Could it be used in stationary hunting? Like if you just drove out to shoot an antelope or you walked 20 yards to a tree stand? Yeah, but you're just, you got way more magnification and way more scope than you'll ever need. And it probably would be almost counterproductive or maybe even cause too much uh, like yeah. overload, you know, and make you make a mistake. Um, yeah. Alex, I think like where this is going to be perfect for is somebody who is getting into precision rifles and you don't exactly know what you want yet. Be so before you go spend $2,000 on a loophole night force tracked, the new Burris XTR pro, which looks so fantastic before you spend money on that, this is it's not going to keep you back. Um, is it going to be as rugged and as reliable in a life or death situation or I would say even in a match environment? I would say no. Um, and there are a few match directors I know that kind of like where joke is, 
Um, a PRS is not complete. A PRS match is not complete until you have somebody with an Arcan fail. <laughs> um, but I think if you go into a controlled situation or controlled environment, um, it's going to be a really, 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 really solid scope for the money. Um, it's, it's, it's the value is there. Um, let's say if you're going to go on a five thousand dollar safari, well, number one, I think it's going to be way too heavy unless you're going to be shooting off of the back of an ATV anyway. Or they're going to hold the animal there for you and you just need to take a shot. Um, but for a match environment or like the target, like say, let's say target shooting and longer range shooting, I think it's going to be fine where the weight is not going to be an issue. The tree reticle is going to be just fine. Uh, like I said, if you're looking in that up to thousand dollar price point, this is going to be a very, very solid scope for the money. Um, yeah, I think. I mean, I, I would, I would agree. Obviously, I don't have one. Maybe one day I'll get one. I hope I do. But uh, I, I did buy a bunch of their rings full price myself. I didn't get them for free, and I bought some of their throw levers last year. And I gotta say, their their rings really impressed me. Oh yeah. Um, I have right here is a Vortex Pro Series ring. If you can see it and then i have their pmr rings and the fit and finish on their rings i actually think is probably as good or better even their pmr ring if i can show you you can't really see but this isn't even like when you look in here this doesn't even line up correctly like it's off center and i like the vortex pro Se or pro series rings because they're a little bit they're lighter yeah. and like similar so like the arcan ring is milled out in here sheds weight on both sides yep. i believe and i think they're milled out are they milled out on top as well not or really no? okay so but i they're very very similar to vortex's yep. uh pro series ring but they're cheaper and the finish i think was actually better yeah um the other and of course they have the um dummy proof how many foot pounds or excuse me, inch pounds oh, yeah. uh, um, for your ring and for your, and I, I love seeing that in rings. I think that I hope all rings go that direction because like we're all humans and it's just like nice to have that reference right there on the ring and you can't yep. screw it up. Um, and I think that's really nice that I'm seeing on rings. Some rings now, some scope manufacturers and rings are starting to put a line on the bottom of their scope tube and then on the ring. So you can kind of easier for those people maybe who don't have a leveling system, they can do it that way and get pretty yep. close. Um, yeah, but and Crimson, uh, and Crimson Trace started doing that on their scopes, I guess like three years ago now, or two really? or three years ago. <laughs> uh, so the Crimson Trace scopes, like they came out with those lines, like right, right. inside that you would just line it with your rings. I'm right. like, oh, damn. I'm like, first I'm like, what is that? And then like, he showed him, like, oh. I want to, I want to say Miopta uh, is doing it. I think that's who I saw at Shot Show that was doing it. Uh, I watched but, one of your videos and it was on there. I think it was yeah. US Optics, I think, possibly did it as well. I I don't know. I think it was I, for sure Myopta. But yeah, when it comes to like, their, and their throw levers, like there's a lot of budget throw levers out yep. there that get the job done. But when it came to their rings, um, I think I actually have them on my Weatherby uh, Backcountry 2.0 right now. Um, I was really impressed at like that $50, $55 mm -hmm. dollar price range on Amazon. I was like, holy smokes, these are pretty good rings um from what i can tell and they had that uh recoil lug uh yep. it in made and in, milled into the metal or whatever and so that's better than of course having like the circular screw on the cheap rings yep. that just goes through um so and i think they were torx head just the same as the vortex yep. um so excellent rings you know hopefully i can get my my hands on more arc and stuff because i wouldn't mind trying it but yeah it, it i think it, i think you're right i think it's going to be a scope that is going to be i mean if qc is good um, then I think that you couldn't really beat it in that price category from a precision rifle standpoint, recreational. If, if weight is not an issue for you, it's going to be very, very tough. Right. It, but it, if you're picking it for hunting, I would say if that's all, if you're really going to be using it truly for hunting, I would say don't get it. But that's a totally different yep. purpose driven. I mean, they're not making hunting scopes, really. Yeah. They're making precision rifle scopes. So. All right. Uh, all right, so since I <clears throat> talked about that, I know this is something that popped up on Ilya's stream. Any thoughts on this current Ukraine-Russia issues? There are no issues except the issues. There, There's no change on the ground in anything at, over the past three or four years except the U.S. media is talking about it, trying to cause a provocation. Um, because, well, let's put it this way. It's going to take... 
but this was it. Why is it that you don't hear anything on the news about the Canadian truckers or what's happening with our rights in this country, but you are hearing about what happens in a third world corrupt nation? Uh, there's nothing different in Russia. Uh, so if we're talking about the troop buildups on the border. No shit, they had military bases, and we're, we're talking about what happens actually, and the, <coughs> they border next to each other. Um, let's face it, there'd be a lot of money to be made if there is a war uh, by the U.S. defense sector trying to, uh, well, let's put it this way, they would be selling a lot more rifles. And now that we're out of Afghanistan, and uh, we're not overthrowing as many countries as we used to in the past, uh, there needs to be a new crisis. And it's funny, yesterday I was watching the movie Canadian Bacon, uh, which is really, really funny, but I mean, it's such a good microcosm because he had a derelict president there that was completely unpopular. So they started, they created a war with Canada in order for the defense sector to make money. And like, voila, that's actually what we're dealing with right now. Uh, but uh, we still have family in Russia. What I will say is, um, no one in Russia wants to take over the territory of Ukraine. It does absolutely nothing for them. And it's almost kind of like the same thing. Like, why isn't Ukraine becoming part of the EU? Well, in the EU, um, as the European Union started expanding east and they brought in poorer and poorer nations, um, that means that France and Germany and Austria, they had to start supporting those countries as well. The difference in the lives between Russia and Ukraine, I mean, it's almost night and day, especially like Eastern Ukraine. No one in Russia wants to support more people. Um, Ukraine is a very corrupt country and I feel bad for the people. Um, let's just say it's fairly unsafe for me to go back there right now because I am an ethnic Russian speaker in Ukraine. Um, but it, it sucks, and I hope we don't go to war over it. Um, well, like I said, and the Russian people don't want to either. Um, it's completely unpopular. Uh, but I guess it's kind of like, imagine in like what's happening in Eastern Ukraine, imagine if the French Canadian, the Quebecois, uh, started invading and, and bombarding uh, people in Ontario because they speak English. I'm sorry, because they speak English instead of French that's kind of what's happening there but it's I see, yeah. it's a sad situation i see uh was it bmg hunters my first set of arcan rings broke on the mount i would be curious did they break on where it goes on your picatinny rail or did it break on the top where you torque it down to the tube um i mean like i said i guess a new company they got to get their qc right and everything i mean it's understandable and well, I mean, if you're talking about that, I have somewhere here a set of loophole rings that broke. <laughs> they snapped on the bottom. Uh, it was one of those like uh, QD systems, and mm. it just completely snapped. Loophole has um, a really cheap set of rings. They even sell them at Walmart. It's a Hunter series type ring. Okay. Now, these Super. Are Mar yep. Oh, really? No, these are like these are eighty dollar or ninety dollar rings. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, there's not any equipment out there, I don't think, by any manufacturer that can't fail. But at the same time, like, if they broke, that's bad on them, and hopefully they sent you a yep. new pair. All right, can we expect to see a new product from Arkin uh, with a 40 millimeter tube, 8 to 40, 56 <clears throat> in the future? Maybe. Uh, the one that is going to have a 40 millimeter tube is um, Swamp Fox, and we did a, I did an Instagram post on it. Um, now, uh, Duke Lu, are you subscribed to Ilya's Dark Lord of Optics channel? Because uh, he might have talked about it. So it's basically, Swamp Fox did have a concept. I have a picture of it that's on my Instagram. It is a 40 millimeter tube, but it's still, I think, only a 5 to 30 or something like that. Um, the reason to go that way is that it's not just for the internal elevation adjustment. It didn't have that much more. The big thing was that when you have a bigger tube, your edge to edge clarity is a lot better. Um, so that's the reason why they went there. Now, as far as Arkin, I did not get it from them, uh, but I think I heard this talked at their booth was a low variable power optic. Uh, that might be, if you're gonna have something next, it might be that. All right, uh, 
Why Dude. not make 60 millimeter instead of 56? Um, a lot more expensive and a lot less accessories for 60 millimeter front objectives. Uh, the well, other thing <clears> is, well, look, look at this rifle here. A 60 millimeter bell housing would end up hitting most rails or barrels. Yeah, you're not going to have enough clearance between the, the bell and the barrel on the rifle or the front rail. Um, where was, there was another question you probably already answered it, though. I was looking at you. So, uh, was it this one? So what's the reason people wouldn't put arc and scopes in a bigger cal than 22 long rifle? You would. Uh, yeah. I, I guess you're saying why would why is it a good scope for a 22 long rifle? Uh, because it has a lot of internal elevation adjustment. Now, what I would say is uh, the first generation of SH4s, the most common issue with those scopes was parallax issues. So the scope, you wouldn't be able to set a proper parallax um, out past like 200 yards. And that's generally going to be the distance that most, well, let's was it from two to 300, it wouldn't <clears throat> make that much of a difference, but let's say you're not going to, so even long range 22 shooters, generally you're going to be at 300 yards or in. So the parallax issues wouldn't be that big of an issue at those distances, uh, rather than others. Uh, but no, there's obviously you'd use it on the, Obviously, you could <clears throat> use it on larger calibers, uh, but the reason why I think it's an ideal 20, 22 scope is that because it has all of the features for ELR or precision 22 shooters at a very budget-friendly price, and any of the most common issues, if they were to happen, wouldn't be a deal-breaker for those guys versus center-fire shooters, if that makes sense. <clears throat> when uh so when you got that kit that comes with the rings and everything you probably answered this earlier but i was in and out of the room did are those rings are this the same quality as the ones they sell individually everything they didn't like cheapen down anything nope. in that kit these are All the right. halo rings these are the exact rings okay as on the website because the same rings as i had before yeah because normally like i've gotten a lot of scopes with rings and stuff and they'll like give you cheaper rings that are useless yep. and it's, so it's like they're bait and switching you so it's good to see that they they aren't doing that because those are they should be good stuff and it's good rings um as a canadian uh, i wish we had alex on here uh as a canadian support our truckers as we take a stand against yep uh <clears throat> look and so it actually was funny i guess it was like a thing i didn't know the trudeau uh his dad was castro um but you like it it's it's uncanny uh but no it's like you know what like I am positively surprised that it's a bunch of Canadians who are standing up for rights versus Americans. Um, now, I do wish we had some of those convoys here shut down D.C. And but, you know, what though, notice that more and more of the states, the liberal states started dropping the mask mandates. All right. Uh, I'll get a chance to compare to ARC and EP5 SH4 and Night Force Attacker. Yep. Like I said, it's gonna it's gonna be interesting. Like I said, so video wise, we'll have a detailed review video on this. Um, I'll have one comparing it to the SH4 Gen 2 and which one you would want to get because I know that's gonna be a common question. Um, and then we'll have some comparisons to the Strike Eagle, the Venom, and the Titan. Um, and I'll try to get an Athlon as well. Um, like I said, if like I said, the biggest thing if you're not opposed to Chinesium. This is a good. This is going to be a solid option. Well, the the Athlon Ares ETR is made in China, yep, as well. Um, well, so basically, it, I, I was I'm talking about that price range. You have the one we were discussing, the Crimson Trace uh, Hardline Pro. You have the Primary Arms GLX, and those are Philippines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the I still think the Athlon Ares ETR is still one of the best scopes I've ever had. I have obviously stuff now that's a bit more expensive and and overall is better but it's very usable scope i <clears throat> their price point hasn't dropped enough to compete though i think with like what's coming into the market on that because like you're saying the that uh ep5 might might be as good and be roughly half the price so um it'll be interesting to see what the you know all these companies come out with i <clears throat> i am i uh i think that uh blackout new scope that came out is pretty cool too but i think that's quite a bit more expensive the japanese made one the japanese um, one is like 
I mean, it's yeah. twenty two hundred dollars. Yeah, it starts it's, at twenty two. It's more than it's more than a loophole. Yeah, I think I think they need to enter that market maybe just a touch lower. But it looked like a great scope at well, the they show. They have that midline one. I think it was the mm -hmm. merge or like that that higher end um, Chinese. Yeah, it's it's higher end Chinese, but it. I mean, it still looked okay, but uh, yeah. Uh, all right, so this is actually a good question. Wesley Flanagan, looking to get into long-range shooting with the scope and don't want to break the bank. Is anything else close to the EP5 under a $1,000 mark? A grand seem to be jumping off point. Um, I would say, like I said, the ones that I think are going to be competing with this are the uh, Element Titan at seven ninety nine. dollars you have the Strike Eagle, which probably is about six fifty to seven fifty, uh, depending on where you find it. Uh, you have the Vortex Venom, which is still going to be competing with it. Um, I would say. <clears throat> what about what about the uh, Athlon Helos? Is that anywhere? So there's think... the Helos. There's the Midas Tack. I don't have specific recollection on with those scopes, mm. um, so I can't comment on those. Uh, I can't compare it, but no, Aplon does have a couple of scopes in that price category that should compete with this really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, I wish Burris had something in that price point. But I mean, so they have the Burris RT25, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is between 650 to 850. Super sharp, super nice reticle. It's by far my favorite reticle. However, it's a 30 mil tube, and it is limited on the internal elevation adjustment which is like, um, so I don't think it's going to compete that well with it. But if you don't need all of that internal elevation adjustment, I think that's a very, very nice scope for the money. Um, I think that's where that one's going to be. Like I said, if, you're, if your budget is 550 to 600, um, if your budget is up to 1,000, it'll be interesting. Uh, but let's say I'm going to get out to the range. We'll actually play with this. We'll take a look at the image quality just to see exactly how good it is. Um, it'll be exciting. So yeah. we'll have, probably in the next two weeks. I think if you were looking for stuff under that price, you mean you could you could look at the Vortex Diamondback, but that's not going to have the Diamondback Tactical, but it's not going to have a zero stop. Um, you could look at the Argos, the Athlon Argos BTR Gen 2. Yep. Um, that's going to have a zero stop, so that would probably be better. But you're going to see, I think you would see a noticeable difference in glass quality. That would, And then the turrets are also going to be a little more mushy uh, once you drop below below that. Um, uh, but if you were, you know, didn't, it, that would be like a, the budget end of things where you just want something good enough um, uh, would be maybe those scopes. That would be less than 450 potentially. Yeah. Um, but. Viper PST Gen 2. Um, I have not played with that scope. I'm trying to recall. <clears throat> I believe it had the same glass as the Strike Eagle, but not as good of features. Maybe. Um, and then um, there's one question about the Miopta Optica 5. I don't know anything about the Miopta lines, but I do know somebody that does, and I will find out. So leave this one as a comment down below, and I will get that answered. Here's a, they say Vortex PST. Viper PST judge, yep. This is it right here. I am going to be doing a bunch more videos on it. I did an initial video on it. It's just like a tabletop um, on my channel, and then we'll be doing a bunch of testing and pairing with it. So. Okay. Uh, Derek, which scope? And if you want to pop on to answer this, come on on. Um, I left the... Let me copy the link so you can pop on as well. Okay. Um, okay, let me um, Derek, if you want to pop on and chat about this one and defend Blackhound, uh, I am go I'm putting it up in our With the, oh, this is a PS, yeah, PST Gen 2. The, I think, you know, it has good glass initial impressions wise. Um, I think that's where you'd see a difference maybe over the budget end of things. But as far as like the turret feel, yep. the, um, <clears throat> the Arkin's going to actually feel just as good. Um, 
and the zero stop's going to be just as good. I mean, I think you're, you're going to see maybe a glass difference, but that's debatable. We'll, yeah. we'll have to find right. out. So, uh, Evil SVT Cobra, um, the only good thing. Uh, PS2 Gen 2 had better glass than the Strike Eagle. Strike Eagle had better scope features, yeah. Mm hmm So, oh. it'll be interesting. Uh, I'll, apps, I'll see if I can find one. Actually, I'll try to send a message to Vortex and see if it can get me one. Okay, uh, Derek, are you gonna come on to chat about that one or now, or are you just getting yourself ready? Okay. All right, now, Stephen, you just put out a couple of videos. So you were there at Chacho. Show. You put out a couple mm -hmm. of videos. On uh, one was the budget rifle scope, which I guess oh. we're, cons we're considering thousand dollar scopes budget. Oh, oh, the top five budget. Uh, yes. Is that one? Um, oh yeah, and then you did the other video, which we're not going to get into because Th those, those were like just, top like, tier more. Sorry, he goes yeah. zero comp. It's like yep, um, but go ahead. Talk <laughs> us, um, talk oh gosh, through. I probably have to look back. Just I've been so busy and so sick, I probably don't even remember what scopes are on there. So you had uh, <laughs> but... so the one we talked about. I think let's actually and this is what's going to be competition to this. Okay, uh, the first one was the Crimson Trace Hardline. Okay, trade. yeah. Well, I, I've I've never tested one in person yet. Okay. At the at the shot show I played with it. You know this, but I played with it at shot show. I played with the Arcnet shot show. From a robust features standpoint, ro uh, durability standpoint, from like an initial impression standpoint, from a tactical perspective, the Arcan seems initial impressions better. Okay. Um, but like QC down the road you know, customer service, all those things matter. I think from a hunting standpoint, I think Crimson Trace initial impressions wise, I'm hoping to start reviewing more of their stuff. But as of right now, I haven't. From a hunting perspective, I think they have more appeal, obviously, than Arcan. Yes. They have a huge line of scopes yeah. and they have lighter scopes. They have, you know what I mean? They're more purpose driven, maybe towards hunting or that like crossover. Yeah, with the um, Rush Line series. Right. And they and, or, and even like even the hard line, um, some of them I don't think weighed as much as the Arkin. So like you got more crossover appeal maybe. Um, but yeah, I, I don't even remember all the scopes on there. I'm trying. To, like, <laughs> so I did play. So the one that would compete with this is going to be the Crimson Trace Hardline Pro mm -hmm. Front Focal Plane, <laughs> six to twenty four or five to twenty five. Um, I actually played with that scope. I did record a video with that scope. I'm not happy with the video. Uh, but I don't have the scope anymore. But Wasn't it, it? Was it the glass? Is that what it was? Or it was. I think it was overpriced for the money. Mm. Um, they had like an MSRP of like nine hundred, mm. and like street price was about seven. Mm. Mm -hmm. The only thing that it has going on, like I said, the knurling on it was nice. It was almost like rubberized for an eyepiece. Um, the turrets. I'm sorry. The reticles suck. The turrets are okay. Um, mm -hmm. Image quality wasn't great. I mean, it was just a little bit sharper than the Arkin SH4 Gen 2, uh, but it was almost twice the price. And I was like, I can't justify it. Uh, yeah. Definitely can't justify that price. Um, yeah. I think there's, I mean, if we look at the evolution of the market, it's insane. It's so competitive with optics. I mean, stuff is progressing so fast. What was a thousand dollars five years ago is is four hundred dollars now and yep. it, it ne it's it, it's good it's a healthy environment it, it gives a lot of options and sometimes it's almost maybe too many options right there's there's a lot of good scopes on the market from i would a lot of say places, i'm gonna but... i'm gonna agree with that comment but i'm gonna put an asterisk on it so i think the features i'm not so the image quality i don't think the <clears throat> image quality improved that much for the price point <clears throat> but it's the features that did yeah, and I was just thinking earlier when you were talking a little bit ago, we see more and more scopes coming in between four and like six hundred dollars with zero stop, locking turrets, adjust, um, you know, um, illuminated reticles, all these first focal plane, all these yeah. things that used to be unattainable for the average Joe. Now they're attainable. But then on top of that, they're coming in at lower price points. But what people I think where they're not still up to the quality of those expensive tier scopes is glass that's where there's they're just not able to give you that good price with all those features and still have that good of glass that's where you're going to see those huge differences especially in like the twilight low light um and maybe with like glare certain types of coatings um 
and maybe maybe like uh, fog proofness and things like that. But generally, I think there's I haven't had too many issues with that. Um, but I think that it's easier for them to give you that zero stop and the locking turrets and all those oh, yeah. things than give you that really expensive like shot glass, right? <laughs> yeah, but, and internal elevation adjustments. I mean, by going to a bigger mm -hmm. tube, that's that. All right, so this is actually an interesting comment. So, okay, okay, guys, Arkin doesn't sell through Amazon. Optics planets are cut off the middleman. Um, there's a lot of truth to that. So when Arkin came out, they started going through a dealer distributor model as well. So one of the channel friends, Af uh, Anarchy Outdoors, <coughs> they did feature and sell the Arkin SH4 Gen 2. But after that first batch of scopes that they got in, they haven't gotten in any additional scopes to replenish that. And that's because by going direct to consumer, I mean, Afla, I'm sorry, Arkin was already overburdened with the amount of orders. I mean, there's more people interested in the scopes than what they could actually deliver um, at the price, well, at the price point at the time. Um, now, what they are doing is the affiliate commissions. Uh, they are pretty hefty affiliate commissions. So when, I'm not going to name the channels, but you know exactly who they are. When people speak very highly of these, and when you go and click the <clears> link, <throat> they're going to get 100 bucks on the scope uh, when you buy it. So instead of paying Amazon, so and if you want to sell your scopes on Amazon, Amazon is going to take right around 30% off the top. Uh, so it, there's a 15%, they take 15% off of the sales price, and then you pay them for fulfillment and storage and everything, which is based off of how big the box is and all of that stuff. Um, so on a scope, they're generally going to charge you between 30 to 35%. Uh, that's what Amazon is making. Um, by going direct, Arkin can reduce those costs. Um, same thing if you go for a dealer. Um, generally, uh, dealers are going to make 50 to 60% profits on a scope. So, so that's why they're able to um, keep the prices down. Um, and it's the same model to what uh, Blackhound started doing, uh, but they called influencers their dealers. <laughs> and they paid them that commission, but it's so yeah. Yeah, it, yeah Derek, give me a thumbs up when you're ready. Those uh, the top five I did have annotated in there. They're not in order of like best, yep. and, and without a field test, I can't tell you that which one's yep. better. Um, with I want I do want your thoughts. Uh, uh, the Citron S6 mm -hmm. looked pretty intriguing. Citron struggled, I think, from a marketing standpoint and brand awareness standpoint. Um, but they have some great products, and I, I don't have my hands on one, but I, I hopefully I can. I think they might be competitive in that area at some point, or they're trying to be. Yeah. Um, and then you have the Hawk Frontier 34, which yes. I don't. What were your? You know, I didn't get a lot of time at the booth. Um, I, I don't know if I'll get my hands on one or not, but what were your thoughts on the actual scope itself? Okay, so uh, Citron, <clears throat> Derek, I'm gonna bring you in just one second. Uh, make sure your audio is good, because that's gonna piss me off. <laughs> uh, all right, so Citron is, they're not a very well, I mean, I think their marketing sucks, but they're one of those companies, if you go to any F-Class match or a bench rest match, mm -hmm. It's two, it's only two names. Well, it's three. Uh, but it's Citron was one of them. It used to be Leupold, and now it's a lot of a night force. Uh, within those communities, uh, Citron makes really, really, really good scopes. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't play with the newest one, but it seems like they're trying to get out of that box and mm -hmm. try to uh, go and try to market to other people. Uh, the other one is um, Hawk, which you brought up. So mm -hmm. I did go back to that booth twice. It is one of those products that I was really interested in, really interested in. And I think that scope is overpriced. Uh, and I think that's actually a great example. So image quality and everything, that Hawk is gonna be competing with this, but mm -hmm. because Hawk primarily distributes through dealers, mm -hmm. that's why that scope is I think MSRP is like fourteen or fifteen hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and it's nothing special. 
right? Um, yeah. Coming back to Cytron real quick, I think yeah. the, just from initial impressions from the guys at the booth, like I've always heard good things about Cytron, um, never heard bad things, but the guys at the booth, super nice, um, which did matter to me, super easy to talk to, but I feel like they really knew their technical side yeah. behind the scenes, but really did suck at the, at the on camera, like knowing what the market wanted kind of, it was like, we're really technical guys. And that's, I think they're trying to change that. Uh, but yeah, well, I, I don't know if you can hold that against them. Uh, but I will Not say really. so last shot show when I was there, it could have been just literally the person that you picked. Mm. But uh, two years ago, when I went to the Citron booth, and I talked to one of the ladies there about getting talk, like I asked her, Hey, uh, who do you who works mm. with content creators or who handles the marketing? They did not have any person in particular who does that. They gave me an email for a support person <laughs> that apparently also every so often handles the marketing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, that's what it is. I mean, and we talk about this, but there is a lot of, in the firearms industry, there's a lot of gun people and there's a lot of business people and there's not a lot of crossover. Um, Citron people, they're gun people, uh, but I don't necessarily know I mean, it, it's funny. So, I guess we are talking about Shot Show. Uh, I guess if you want to, if you guys want to talk about this now, um, or if you have any more, if you have any more questions on the EP5, just put them in, and we'll address those. Um, but, it did, like, so doing some of those interviews with some of the companies, I just wanted to politely tell them, you know what? Let me just do this myself because you suck on camera. Um, it, it was almost kind of like pulling teeth and it, it was like, it yeah. was bad. Um, yeah. And it's like, and how companies send representatives to interact with people and they suck on camera is just, I'm like, I, I just don't know. Uh, it's mm -hmm. like, here you are, you're sending them to the biggest sales show in the world to the one that for a lot of companies, a lot of smaller companies, this is your make or break event and these people are either horrible or they have no people skills it's like it's unexcusable um unless i mean even if you only have one or two people look if you can afford to spend eight thousand dollars on a booth um you can afford to spend a thousand bucks to fly out somebody with a personality mm -hmm. <laughs> just uh it looks like citron i'm just looking at their website it looks like they came out with a, a 40 millimeter tube rifle scope i didn't even know that um, so here's a comment. So at F class matches, I see Cytron, March, Night Force, Vortex, Golden Eagle, and Trigicon. Yep. Um, like I said, it's it's those markets. And then if you go to PRS match, uh, well, and Derek will be able to answer that because he does a couple of those. Uh, but it's going to be Zero Comp. It's going to be Vortex Razor Gen Threes. Uh, you have yep. a couple of people with loopholes. You have a couple of people with Burris, and well, people who more... are getting people getting in. You're going to have an Arkin sh4 until they spend more and then you're going to have one person there with a black hound which is uh derek <laughs> well not anymore um I, no i've upgraded um i'm actually got a gpo now so, Ooh. Whoa, whoa. So, whoa. so instead of saying no 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 whoa. there's more than one person shooting a black hound black hound's representation within prs just went back to zero <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, you know, when it comes to the new line of Black Hound Scopes, I'm really looking forward to getting that one when it comes in a May uh, on the Emerge line. So the Evolve line is going to be their mid-tier, and I think it's it's going to be there. They're a little more expensive. They don't go anything past 1000 on that one. So I think they're between 600 and 1000 for that line. And that's right there in lines with Arkin. That's the, that's the mid-line one, right? That's the mid-line, which okay. is the Evolve. Yes. Uh, the Emerge is their new expense is the new uh, expensive line with all Japanese glass, mm -hmm. Japanese internals, and everything. I, I love but, that green green color they got that little yes. accent. Yes, I do. But you know what? The, Me okay, too. I'm sorry. So I might say, like, I would say that the midline from Blackhound looks interesting, and I think it's a smart step. But yes. I'm sorry, who the hell? So okay, so we have people watching this. Even if it's a really really good scope, how many of you? would actually oh wait i can do it as a poll but i got a lot damn it do, do i have any moderators on today
but how many of you would actually spend $2,200 on a Blackhound scope? Even though it's made in Japan, it's not made by Blackhound, it's made for them. And the reason why I'm thinking about it is because resale. You are not going to be able to get any... Okay, look, Loophole Mark V for $2,100 or a Blackhound for $2,200. I'm sorry, tw both of them are going to be $2,200, call it. Yeah, get, something like you, that. You can easily flip a loophole Mark V HD for I don't, a lot I, of your money. I, I don't even think consumers would necessarily think about the flipping aspect or resale. They're going to think about like brand trust. Like they're just like, I don't know this person. How do I know they're going to get, you know, be faithful to their warranty if something goes wrong? Something along yeah. those lines. Like it's just, it's too risky, which is why, unfortunately, they probably need to, they'll have to, I think they're going to have to lower the prices on that. To be and competitive, it, and I think it probably I, will be. Uh, I, think, I think. Well, I, I don't think they're going to be. I don't think they will sell at MSRP. I think they're going to have to come down to a street price on them and be and be reasonable with it. To be honest with you, I mean, yeah. But From, on, I, I'm impressed with the new reticles that they have. I will well, say that. Feeling the new scope, I mean, the turrets, the zero stop, the uh, revolution indicator, I guess Derek had something to do with the development of that. Like all those aspects of that scope are might be worth what they're saying it's worth. It's just that brand awareness isn't there yet. I think uh, it's a, let me know if you guys can see the poll. I think it should agreed. be there. Um, well, it's like this new company here. I mean, they've been out for a few years. It's called uh, Germ uh, GPO, which stands for German Precision Optics. Um, they make a really nice German scope. In it. But it's a nice scope. Yes. Uh, it's it's a four and a half to twenty seven by fifty, which is I, I love fifty millimeter objective scopes. And you know, I'm looking forward to playing around with this one and using it on one of my rifles this year is that, for cop. Is that a cap turret or is it just a really tall turret? Uh, the uh, the, ele the elevation turret on there. No, I couldn't it's tell. A, it's a regular turret. Oh, uh, okay. So so it's what's kind of nice about this is it has both a zero stop and locking turrets. So it's that, that's it's a, a nice little feature. Yeah. A lot of hunters like the locking and the zero stop. Yeah. I, see, the one thing I love on this is the illumination dial. It's smooth like a parallax. Ah. It, it's not, it doesn't yeah. click. And I really, really like that. Yeah, there's um, not that many scopes out there with a dim, like a dim switch. It's like it's, yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. All right, so let's actually answer these questions. This is actually a really good okay. one. I think there are risks for sure, but does work great if the products are good. Influencers get positive impressions from viewers too. What do you guys think? So basically the whole idea of working, focusing more on video and content creators, and I hate the word influencers, than others, and then there is there's a quick follow-up on this one that was very much related to this that i wanted to highlight okay saw some videos of interviews of arc and ceo at shot show no personality for camera at all <laughs> that's why they use influencers instead um okay, so this is that's why i didn't do my video with him <laughs> yeah, so i did <laughs> hey, you know, the fact that he spoke English is a really good positive <laughs> on there <laughs> versus Vor, uh, Vore, uh, Voyer. <laughs> Any case, yeah. um, so it's actually interesting because that the video that I published, that was Michael Riley. That was the second video that I redid uh, mm. because the first interview was with the Asian owner, Ye. I think he pronounces Ye. Uh, and I thought he was really good and passionate, but he's not the typical camera guy. But then actually my, uh, what happened was the audio failed on me. So I'm like, okay, let me actually just redo it. So I redid it. Uh, but going back for the footage, I think he would have, actually the interview with him would have been even nicer. Um, so hopefully. I feel like, was it, is Michael Riley's the, sh the shorter guy, right? The, the shorter Navy guy, Seal? he was the former yeah, yeah. military guy. He That's did, why he he's did. like that. He, he did mine and I almost literally was like considering doing like a, a, a sarcastic joke video just because it was so funny to watch him. But like at the same time, like I don't like I think people might think he's rude. I think he's just he's 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 a military guy. Like it's just a different he has a lot of bearing. It's it's a different mindset. He, he's is. not he's not a marketing guy. He's not a salesman. I, I don't think it's a personal thing. I think it's just his personality is is dry, maybe in a sense or it comes across that way. But, but also, I would say, keep in mind, depending on the day that you go in there, 
is uh, it looks. I'm gonna need to plug my camera in, um, and I'll let you guys discuss this one. But it, depending on when you get there to Bema Chacho, they do a lot of these speeches, and we just get sick and tired of it. <coughs> but I want to. So I w was really excited about the Hawk, uh, 34 millimeter, and it was the first scope company that I went to. They were the first one to. Uh, so all my appointments were scheduled. That's why I didn't have a lot of time to run around. And I scheduled that. It was my first appointment of the day on the second day. It was like at 8.30 yes. in the morning. I get there. I get there and like, and there's the marketing person there. I'm like, hey, would you be comfortable doing a video? And she's like, no, 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 it's, it's way too early in the morning. Come back later. I'm like, I'm not going to have time later. Uh, so I just took the information and chatted with one of the other people there, played with the scope. I come back <laughs> a different day towards the end of the day. I'm like, hey, you ready to do a video right now? Oh, no, I'm just like, already too tired and almost like the end of SHOT Show. I'm sorry. I, I don't feel comfortable doing a video. I'm like, that's your job. You're the marketing person for the company. It's like, that's your one job. And that's what you have. So it's like it's yeah. somebody was parting a little too hard. Well, would you rather have the person that knows what they're talking about and from a tactical, a tactical standpoint, but is really good like on camera or have the person who knows nothing about what they're talking about but is outgoing or with with hawk you had the person that in the interview was personable but doesn't know what they're talking about and doesn't want it to work i think that one was a little bit different but generally yeah. i'd rather have somebody who is better and more comfortable presenting the point because if there's something that i ask them that they don't know there's no. generally a tech person or a product person there that's close by that we can cut to and get an answer that we need to. And this is actually a good example of that was when I have a couple of videos coming out with global ordnance on the RX pistols and the Strybogs. And the person, she was awesome. The very marketing person, fantastic. Great personality, great on camera. Uh, one of the easiest interviews to do. And there were a couple of times where like we had a specific question and she's like, okay, so we cut, we cut it and we got it and we refilmed it. Um, so, and I prefer to have that than to try to have like somebody who's completely uncomfortable on camera because it's like their nerves just aren't there. It, it's just, it's horrible. Uh, but this is also why for, for Palmetto State Armory interviews. Um, I did do a detailed one with uh, Josiah from Palmetto State Armory. And then I'm like, okay, you know what? Let me actually just record my own summary too uh, afterwards. And that's the one that I released. And the other one I'm going to release a little bit later. Uh, all right. So before this, yes, I'm going to teach Ilya how to do a poll. And we're going to go back to it. Um, there was a question follow up. And this, I know you have experience with this one. Um, super excited about the optics market now with all the advanced and new features for the money. Yes. Are you going to review the new Vortex Razor Gen 3 and against the Burris Pro at some point? Uh, I don't have a Razor Gen 3. I'm going to ask for one. Um, that guy right there has one. I'll let him talk about this. And the Burris Pro I did play with. I played with that one back in August, the Comp Expo. And I should have one as soon as they're available to ship out um but that would be really really good all right so uh yes. go ahead and chat about this one i'm gonna go plug the camera in well i got the vortex razor gen 3 bought it full price um but anyway i i don't know anything about the other scope you're referring to really so i'm not gonna uh, try to give you a comparison on it or anything like that but what really impressed me with the razor gen 3 is that it has the i believe it's l tech plus i might be saying that wrong uh zeroing system and zero stop system so what's really like i've never seen on any other scope is it comes with a tool you put in here or you can put a quarter in there you turn this and it's fluid there's no clicks there's no audibleness anything like that and you actually zero the scope with this set on zero the whole turret set on zero you zero this and it can zero between uh quarter moa or between mil radiant so you can get that perfect zero and then it automatically sets your zero stop when you do that it also has the cocked indicator on the side and that the the zero stop or this the sighting it in is the same for both the windage and elevation as far as using that uh system that's super revolutionary in my opinion one of the coolest things i've ever seen there's one bad thing about this scope or at least i think it is and 
and basically what it is is lift up because it's a locking turret right you have adrenaline going you have fatigue going you go to spin fast you put any downward pressure on that turret and it locks itself down as you're going and that could be a huge problem i think especially on the elevation maybe not on the windage because i don't think people really push down on that as they're turning it um so uh, apart from that initial impressions i'll be doing tons of videos on this and i'll be doing comparison videos but uh, initial impressions like on the glass and everything else about it is like wow this is a really top tier scope from vortex yeah. um, what's the but, what's the price in that one msrp is 39.99 yeah it's not cheap what's the street price um i haven't seen one yet i don't was remember it, what i was paid it three thousand or i want to say it was around or just below three okay so then the burst pro is going to be probably around 2200 that's going to be interesting um like whether the extra 800 bucks is going to make up for the difference i think i think i mean what what my impressions but i don't have a lot of impressions to go off of yet um like so we'll be doing range reviews and everything on it but uh a lot of other people are basically reporting that this glass is is really good so i think that's where it would give the other scope run for its money but um i'm looking up the price on this right now the burst pro is nice i played with it over at the mdt booth at shot show i know i was talking to pete from impact shooting about it um no, it's going to be so like your optics has it $3,900. That your uh, optics, okay? Why is like hero optics? The um, but then again, the pricing. So I do get law enforcement pricing, so it's showing that which is 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 less. So it's a little, I gotta look at a different website here, okay? 2500 nope. That's the uh, different version. I can't find the version in stock anywhere to even find the price, like a good street price to give you guys. Uh, but another thing that I like about this one is the parallax goes, I believe, lower than the Gen 2. goes all the way down to um, 20 or 10 yards, excuse me. So if you did want to use this for 22 LR or something <coughs> like that, um, you could. Um, it has the same style of illumination adjusting uh, adjustment where you pull out on this knurled metal um, cap right here and it's on off on off with alternating settings um, but yeah go ahead and check out my video bolts for bucks youtube channel if you want to see the desktop review on it and that's the first i have that out now i don't have the rest of them out but um it's not a cheap scope though and a lot of people are saying basically, well, if I'm going to spend that much, I might as well get a, a Steiner or Schmidt and Bender or something else that uh, has more, you know, top tier appeal to it in the name, uh, you know, but which is understandable. But uh, we'll see how it pans out. I'll be doing I did a comparison video, a desktop comparison against the Gen 2, um, but I'm going to also do a range comparison as well against the two. Oh, uh, this uh... <laughs> Damn it. All right, so lesson learned. Um, even though this battery is good, I'm waiting for extra batteries on my stupid expensive camera. Um, and it looks like when I was had the plug I had wasn't that great. So it might die, but I'm still here. Worst case, I'll switch to the camera. But we've been on for over two hours anyway, so we might we'll go for these questions. All right, I wish Impact Shooting would get out of the Vortex sponsorship. He has great content so far. Yeah, his content production quality is fantastic. That's one of the reasons yes. why I love Petey, and we got a chance to meet him at uh, SHOT Show a number of days. Uh, I mean, his production quality is fantastic. Uh, I love his video production quality. Did, did you find that? Does, I don't, does he edit his own film? I never, I forgot yeah. to ask he him. He does everything. He, he that's, edits his that's own That's impressive stuff. then. I wasn't sure. I never, I forgot to ask him that. He edits. Okay. Uh, the Burris is competing more with the Leupold Mark V HD, correct? Yes. Um, as far as the price goes, I agree. Vortex is now firmly in a night force attacker or zero comp land. So, I mean, that's the thing that you have to consider though, is that the Vortex is one of those traditional companies where we're gonna have a very high MSRP and then the street price is gonna be significantly below that. Um, mm -hmm. Just like Athlon is like one of those that's gonna copy the same model. And look at also what's mm -hmm. happening with the Vortex Gen 2 prices. They started out very high and then they just started coming down more and more uh, furthermore. Um, I think 
Uh, Burris is also going to have an MSRP of like 25 or 2600 maybe even closer yeah. to 3000 um, But I think a, uh, this will be a good one for Ilya because he's played with both. I think he has a Gen 3. Um, but he, so let's put it say. When I asked Ilya if he thinks that that scope is worth 4000 the answer is no. Uh, but if it's worth, okay, it's like going to charge. I'll do this. I'll switch my camera in a bit. Um, uh, hold on. Actually, let me just switch the camera and answer this one. Uh, video input. HP vision. There we go. Hi. All right, so I got to do this now while the camera charges. All right, so um, when I asked him if... Oh, this is so weird that like the laptop is so low. I'm gonna change this up. I'm like I hate looking up at myself. It does. It does look like it's probably gonna be around three thousand street price, but it's so far hard to find in stock right now. It's kind that's, of hard. And to that's tell. why that's why um, we're getting that price. And yeah, well, it it, it MSRP is higher than that, um, than yep. three thousand. Yep. But it's yeah. We'll see how see how it pans out. Um, but yeah, why would people get that when they can get a, a something like a Night Force or something like that in well, that but same price the thing, though, if, you look, if you look at features wise, um, Night Force has very good marketing and people who are willing to justify and pay the, those prices. Um, it's Night Force. I mean, the the the, uh, the Kool Aid is strong there. Uh, the Kool Aid is quite strong there. Yeah, but their warranty sucks. Here. Never dealt with them. If I was if I was gonna buy okay. the Gen two so, or the Gen three though, I'd buy the Gen two for most reasons because I'd like the turrets better on the Gen two, and it's gonna be a lot cheaper. But, I mean, here's the whole reason why. Um, yes, Night Force makes a nice scope. I'm not gonna say they don't, but their warranty sucks. Their warranty is only good for five years, and after five years, you're fucked. And at the same point, once the Plus, side with the Vortex is doesn't matter if you have it for five years, ten years, or twenty years. If you break it, they replace it. Okay. So, I mean, that's the only downfall I look at with Night Force is their warranty. Okay. And they might be forced to change that in the future. All right, here's one yeah. for you. Uh, opinions on the biggest disruptor companies in the scope business in the past five years. Um, I don't have to think too hard about this one. Do you? And if we don't have the exact same one, I'm going to be really. Well, you go first then. <laughs> I would say Arkin. Um, I, I would say Arkin for the sole reason that they are forcing other companies to compete at the price point and to pack more features for the money. So I would say that for, like I said, if you're talking about the disruptor in terms of not necessarily innovation, definitely not innovation, uh, but just the biggest force, um, I would say Arkin, because they are making front focal plane rifle scopes at an affordable price. Um, okay. I would say at the high end, I would probably say zero comp. Uh, Ilya would probably say something that has like, from the technological perspective and I don't think it's anything in the scope business. I think it would definitely have to be in thermal or night vision, something on that side of it. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, a difficult question for me to answer. I think, I think um, Arkin's had a huge impact in just the last three years on the market or so. Um, but like, I don't think they've innovated. They have a very small product line. For yep. from that standpoint, they've. They've done no disruption. Like in a hunting scope standpoint, they've done no disruption. Um, I think that Athlon's a serious competitor. Yes. I, th I They're just. I feel like they kind of glide under there and don't get noticed as so much. Good. But they've if you're done. Some... Say, if you're going to say ten years, I would say Athlon. Athlon, <laughs> Arkin, and uh, here's here's the weird thing. Vortex is still disrupting the market. Oh yeah. Let's not forget that. There's they're like everybody's trying to fight with Vortex up to that what two thousand three thousand dollar scope oh, price yeah. line um so they're still they're still out there and i mean they made the venom they made all these they, they put out all these models they're still disrupting the market to a degree it's just a different 
way of seeing what what that question might mean okay what does that mean okay. um but uh I, yeah arkin's like the most obvious like because they're taking all the feature set of a thousand dollar scope and making it 500 bucks and undercutting everybody else i'm not sure i've seen okay. a stronger kool-aid than what the vortex guys are drinking the vortex kool-aid is strong but it's not as <laughs> strong as arkin and it's not as strong as zero comp um those kool-aids are much uh more potent and less diluted <laughs> okay um i'm gonna say right on optics Okay, so in full disclosure, Mr. Derek is a right on pro staff member. No, actually, no. They shut the pro staff program down. I am no longer a pro staff member. So let me let me see let me say why. Because they have multiple lines like like Vortex, and on top of that, you can get a scope from them from anywhere between two hundred dollars all the way up to two thousand dollars. So they have a wide variety of scopes, and the X five line is one of my favorites. Um, I shoot with the X5 line on my competition rifle. I have one of the X3s. I have one of the original Mod 7s, uh, Gen 2s. But they have, they've come into the market with a whole other set of scopes this year. And now they're in the spawning scope game. And honestly, a lot of people didn't think Rhydon was going to make it past three, four years. Well, they're still here. So they're making a good scope for for everybody's budget from zero to 2000 and you know i've never had a problem with them and i've never had to send any of my scopes out for warranty uh, my mod 7 is built like a tank so but i mean it's open opinion i mean i agree arkin has had has set a uh, a precedence inside of a price but under 600 dollar team but i don't have any experience with arkin other than what I looked at at SHOT Show. I've never shot one, and honestly, I'm not going to throw my own money on it. Okay. Um, so there's a comment here about Swamp Fox. Uh, I'm not going to say that Swamp Fox is innovative. The reason why is because most of the time, they just, they were the third party, <clears throat> oh, they were the third party uh, that connected Chinese OEMs and American companies, and that's how uh, some of our products look eerily similar to other companies um but it did make me think of hollow sun uh because if you're talking about particularly red dots and pistol sights well hollow yeah. sun really blew it up in the past few years yeah I, yeah i mean i don't really i didn't i don't think of them when with scope questions but yeah okay for red dots yeah i mean especially in the pistol red dot market yeah I think, I think, um, right on yes. is really trying to compete in the Athlon niche. Yeah. They're, they're very direct competitors with Athlon. I feel like, I feel like Athlon's just been ahead of them a little bit. Um, and I think, uh, but, uh, yeah. And Athlon is a great company. Um, Athlon is, it's a really good company. Um, I think for the money, it's one of the sharpest glass you can find um i don't think the features are the most innovative i am a fan of their reticles um and their chronos line it's fantastic scope i mean it's all japanese um uh the aries etr is also <laughs> supposed to be very very good for the money as well i th i think um i don't know it's probably been what six seven years now but when they first came out with the athlon um argos btr the first mm -hmm. generation that was a very mm -hmm. competitive scope at that time that was like the arkin not that you know not quite there but that was kind of like that scope at yeah. that time that was like what do you go to for all the features cheap but it can, and it gets the job done um and that was kind of the scope the, yeah the turrets are a little mushy yeah the glass wasn't very but it could kind of it had everything you needed to start in like prs or something if you wanted to and it was really affordable um and I had one. It, it tracked fine and it held zero fine and all that. What is it? Is is it as good as the Arkin is now? Like the Ar the EP five? It's not even close. Just initial impressions wise, like the Gen one I mean, the, Argos. But I mean, you could bring. <clears throat> I mean, that's the whole thing with Blackhound. They weren't trying to make a scope to be in the comp competition world. Uh, it just happened for them because <laughs> honestly, it was a good reticle for 
for what the cost of the scope was. The scope was is built like a tank. I mean, I've shot it on both 338, 65, 308. Which scope? On okay. it. Uh, the Blackhound. The okay. Genesis line, the original line. So, but for $400, it was a great scope for somebody to get into because you got rings, the bubble level, uh, to mount it, and you got the scope, the sunshade, and the, and the scope covers. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, like I said, this company wants to evolve into something more. It's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen this year with it. Yeah. I mean, and, like I said, and the one interesting point about Blackhound is that they completely revamped all the employees at the top end. Uh, they cleaned house. You have a whole yeah. bunch of new people in here. So, And they changed their approach as well because they tried to go consumer direct. And now you see Blackhound scopes on Amazon. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there was a question here. <laughs> and, uh, do you find the scope for the gun or do you find the gun for the scope? Depends on if you ask Ilya or not. Depends on the purpose. Is it a competition rifle? Is it an all-purpose rifle? Is it just for hunting? It depends. I, I, I generally buy... Well, because I do reviews now, I might buy guns I would never buy otherwise. Um, but I think that you buy a gun that fits the purpose for which you're going to use it for. And then mm-hmm. you find the scope that fits that best in what you're going to use it for. It's all supposed to be, should be purpose driven because if you have a Hubble telescope on a six pound hunting rifle, it's going to not be worth it. It's going to cause more problems than it's worth. That's it's just going to happen. Uh, so I think they should be mashed, uh, appropriately. Uh, that's my opinion. But. Okay. Uh, so we're getting overwhelmed with questions now too. Uh, Somebody asked about monstrum scopes. Yeah, we'll get to it. Okay, all right, okay. Ruger Precision 6.5 Creedmoor hunting starting PRS rifle. Is EP5 a good starting point scope? Um, I think if it's your budget, I think this is a very nice scope for the money. Um, if you can go 100 bucks less. Well, was, I think for hunting, it sucks. I think the, PR, the Ruger Precision sucks for hunting because it's a heavy-ass gun, and you're adding a heavy-ass scope on it. Yeah, I'm like pointing at my other camera. Which <clears> the <throat> but for, P, for PRS, if it's in your budget and you're say, trying to stay under $2,000, I think it's going to fit your needs. Why is Ruger Precision 6.5 Creedmoor hunting? What is uh, uh, hunting, hunting or, or PR? Like, if you're really going to be using it every season for hunting at a significant amount, I wouldn't use that. Um, I have one. I got it for hunting. Guess what? This was like eight years ago when I started getting into guns more, and I never used it for hunting. I said I would. I was like, I'm going to use this for hunting. I know I am. Don't tell me I'm not. Yeah. Guess what? I never have. It, it's it's heavy. It's bulky. It catches on stuff. Um, there's a lot of reasons why um, there's a lot of hybrid style rifles right now. In fact, I think it's probably like really becoming super popular. You got like the Bergara um, yep. HMR. You have the Bergara. What's the new one they just came out? Um, yeah, that new one. <laughs> it's a premier one. Um, the Magnesium. Divide. But they came out with the Bergara Divide. It has yeah. a, sto- yeah, it's the divide. a, a yes. carbon fiber stock, I believe. So like there's yeah. tons of these rifles that are kind of around that like eight pound weight and they're um got the uh, uh, cheek riser they have adjustable uh, enough adjustability in it to you where you could actually use it like prs or elr but it's still going to fit hunting better as well and that's what i if i was going to use something for both i'd be looking in that direction rather than the ruger precision um or the christian arm mpr the new christian uh, the well you mean the uh modern the mhr Modern no, hunting uh, rifle. It's it's MHR modern, modern hunting rifle. Modern precision rifle. Okay. It's their car. It's their carbon fiber for the FF carbon fiber barrel. The yeah, it's is not, it the new? Not the new one. The, it's oh. the one that's been out for a while. Okay. Okay. It comes in either I, burnt bronze or black. It comes in chambered from six five all the way up to three three eight. Yeah, I was thinking like uh, Christensen Ridgeline or the brand new one, which their whole new system oh, with the yeah. MHR, which is they have interchangeable new technology, carbon fiber and, and stuff. We'll see what happens with that. It's even a new receiver actually, but um, mm-hmm. we'll we'll see what happens there. But yeah, but my Ruger, this will make. Uh, you happy. My Ruger is and has been one of the most accurate rifles I've ever had. Yeah. All right. So uh, for hunting particular, so there was one gentleman on the channel that, I know <clears throat> that was in Texas. Um, he actually does hunt with like ELR hunting with a Ruger Precision and 338 Lopwa. 
but he is disabled, so he hunts um, off of an ATV, and he, well, it's a side by side with a gun mounted next to him. So for him, it works. Um, I think if you're gonna be lugging that gun around, it's like it's a little bit impractical. So I would say is pick a purpose for it and then just kind of stick with it, um, unless you're gonna do, if, unless you're gonna do it very very occasionally. Um, but a good PRS rifle is going to be very different from a good hunting rifle. Um, simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've, I've hunted with six to 36 power scopes or six to third or, you know, 4.5 to 30 power scopes. And I can tell you, uh, you get adrenaline, you get fatigue, you get, you're worn out and you, your tendency is to not be able to multitask enough to really use it or you throw that magnification level or level all or lever all the way up and the next thing you know you're like zoomed way in and then you shoot and you can't see where you hit you can't see if you hit you can't make a follow-up shot because you have too much magnification um and or what, what most people do especially if they're not used to shooting a rifle at the range or hunting is they can't find the animal once they look in the scope there's like right there but they have too much magnification so like you want to get equipment that uh, fits it right you know like the vortex lht scopes are great for hunting especially if you want to use a scope for like long range and hunting those are really lightweight they're, they have a great feature set um they're not cheap um but those are good scopes yeah and i think uh, go ahead no you're good i was gonna say Ilya always he's a big fan of those as well yeah uh, aplon has always been solid <clears throat> glass and price point they have sets a standard for new budget scope to include good reticle target turrets and zero stop i would agree with that completely until larkin um it, because they, they took that price and brought it even lower if you if i was going to spend my own 500 dollars though i would i would still buy athlon i know i'm i because i have trust in their name and their warranty yes. and their longevity and admittedly yes they've worked with me before so maybe that does affect my opinion but i i think that i would i would still pick them i think i would just because uh, They've been around a little bit longer, but. All right, I'm gonna skip some of these because we've kind of covered it. Um, all right, so Monstrum. All right, so I've actually played with quite a few of these Monstrum scopes. Where's that comment? All right, I. Drew, Drew okay, just here. placed one up. All right, there we go. No, because basically, when, on, on the Melon app, when there's a new comment, it just resets that scroll. So I gotta keep going back to it. It's kind of butt. All right, how about Monstrum for the most effective scopes in it, for the most effective scope area? Okay, so Monstrum, they're gonna do a front focal plane for about 250 bucks. Um, I think if that is your budget, I think they're gonna get you what you need, but they're not gonna be the sexiest, they're heavy. Um, I've done a crap ton of, I've had, exp I think I've had 12 or 13 Monstrum scopes. Um, I have Amazon videos on pretty much most of these Monstrum scopes. I have not done a YouTube video, but um, I am going to be working with Monstrum on a couple of educational videos where we are going to be looking at their two, basically what you get in a front focal plane rifle scope for 250, 500, 1000, and then 2000. So we're gonna use the Monstrum scopes. Um, I do have a range now where we can go out to 700 and uh, we'll be able to do through the scope footage to kind of go through and get you what you need. Um, is it a front focal plane rifle scope for about 250 to two, uh, for 300? Yes. Um, is, does it gonna have uh, tracking error? Yes. Um, is the eye box kind of eh? Yes. Yes. Uh, but if you're looking for a front focal plane rifle scope that's going to give you the magnification, uh, it's going to be a really good scope. I think the 4 to 16 is actually really nice because at a 4 to 16, um, the eye box wasn't terribly bad. I think it was actually pretty good. Um, I actually think their uh, low variable power optics are actually quite nice, especially the newer ones. Um, I, I, quite nice for almost any price point wow. um they sell a crap ton of scopes but the reason why more people aren't talking about them is because they don't pay influencers to talk about their scopes um they send them out and so here's basically the thing 
Uh, they're gonna send it, they're gonna offer the scopes for free to influencers and somebody who's starting out, they would take them up on that offer. I.e., let's say for example, someone like Shooting Gallery in New England. Uh, but if you try to approach- For me. All right, there you go. I mean, uh, I if, it, it's if, on Amazon, right? Let, let's just- <laughs> uh, We're not gonna go there. Um, no, but not if, tonight. If you're, gonna go, if you're gonna try to, let's put this up. If it's a no-name company, let's put this up, okay. If Arkin or Sig or Crimson, like a company you've heard of, if they approach any one of us and be like, hey, uh, we want to release a new product, can you review it for us? All of us are going to be say yes, because it's going to bring in views and stuff. Um, Derek or Steven, how many a week do you get emails from Chinese scope sellers from companies you've never heard of trying to get you to review a video and they're going to do you a favor and send you out their $30 optic for free. <coughs> um, I actually don't LinkedIn get that. Is famous. I don't get that many <laughs> scope companies doing that, okay. but I get endless amounts of Chinese companies emailing me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, I actually, uh, I have some secret plans for some really goofy budget videos for YouTube. And I also have a lot of plans for Amazon you know, we'll, we won't go there. Okay. But I, 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 I do have an entire huge box right now of brand new Monstrum scopes, scope rings, and red dots. And uh, I gotta say, they, they communicated nicely with me. Yeah. Um, they didn't, they, they are not, that's true, they are not paying me. They are letting me keep the stuff for free. Um, I'm gonna try to bring some really fair uh, reviews. Uh, most of that will not be on YouTube. It'll be on Amazon, uh, but uh, we're, you know, I'm going to incorporate some stuff on there, yeah. but I, 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 initial impressions on their scopes wasn't great. I think there was one red dot and I can't remember which one it was, which Vader. model, but it, it, uh, one wasn't too bad. I yep. think there was one, there's a couple that I was like, okay, these are really, really low end. And, um, but I, I haven't dove into that box enough. Uh, okay. I think. So I think if I was going to go for a budget scope, though, I would look for like the old Athlon uh, Argos BTR, the first gen, um, over them. But maybe I'm wrong to. Well, to it depends that. on the price point because I mean, pretty much for most expensive scope is going to be like two fifty. Um, so is it for the money, we're going to get you the features that you need, uh, but it's not going to be the most. It's not going to be the best experience um, that you can find. There's definitely going to be diminishing returns. Uh, their prismatics are actually pretty nice. Um, the Vader red dot is actually quite good, and it's the same OEM as basically the SIGs. Uh, there are a couple of other... Oh, I think the $15 premium scope rings are actually really good. Mm -hmm. I think they're amazing for the mm -hmm. money. And they yeah. have some new scope rings with bubble levels in them. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, so, but we're actually going to take a couple of those scopes. We're going to run them through the paces. Uh, they have a new 6036 and a 5 to 25. So we'll play with those as well. And we'll actually shoot them at 800, 700 to 800, um, back to back with more expensive options to kind of figure out exactly what you get for the money. And I got, for the new people who are, if you have a whole bunch more people just joining now, I'm using my webcam because my stupid expensive new camera the battery on it sucks so it's charging up right now <laughs> I, it sounds like you're gonna go more in depth than i probably will just because of the time and money expense i don't really have to put yep. into the monstrum stuff but i am planning on doing quite a bit on it um and i have to admit he's right the rings i was pretty impressed with for that really really budget ring actually probably usable i mean for 99 percent of the people out there um they probably were and uh, so that's funny and uh oh Link yeah had the exact same comment yeah, it, it, like if you were like, okay, so like for example, I have a, I had a 6.5 Creedmoor Savage, it was a Savage okay. um, Access, wasn't even the Savage Access 2. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, so I have a set of those uh, premium rings on my $1,500 Athlon Kronos behind there. Those rings, I mean, the fit and finish on them is not, like the actual uh, powder coating on it is not the greatest, but the actual rings themselves are quite good. And it said they use all Torx screws. Mm -hmm. uh, they're really nice Torx screws. Mm -hmm. um, I have absolutely no problems I, with them. Yeah, it, like if you were, like, so I have that. I had a Savage Axis two six five Creedmoor. I put an eighty dollar like Bushnell banner or Bushnell Dust of Dawn scope on there, 
And this guy's been, I sold it. This guy's been using it for like four years hunting and he actually uses it hunting and it's been fine. It's held zero. So like, we don't have to be under the delusion that everybody needs really expensive equipment. It's going to depend on what you're using it for, um, what the purpose is and how hard you may, may be going to abuse it, but you can get by with cheaper stuff. I mean, not everything has to be super expensive. My first scopes were cheap. I still have a Bushnell and gauge scope that I think at the time was maybe 300 bucks. I have it on a hunting rifle for four or five years. It's been beat around. It's fine. I can, I can, tra it tracks all right. Everything works fine. Um, and especially with rings, I found a lot of companies out there with cheap rings and maybe I sound like an idiot, but I have had great luck with cheap rings. Now, do you get the rings with like, we talked earlier where they have the screw going through in the recoil? No, you don't really want to do that. Or do you know, you can, you'll, you're, you know and what Phillips said? Well, and here's the thing, the Monstrum premium rings, they have two re square recoil lugs yep. in them. Yeah, it, you, you don't want rings with Phillip heads or flat head screws, or you don't want rings like that. You don't want rings with huge gaps. I'm trying to, oh, like, you don't want rings like this. You don't want these, right? You don't want these. Those usually come with, you know, as free, look at that, it's, it's like a flat head. Um, you don't want those. Those are basically, you know, airsoft rings is, in my opinion. So it's like, you don't want that, but at the same time, you don't need to buy a $200 pair of rings or a hundred dollar pair of rings or even a $75 pair of rings. Um, there's no reason to, what you want to look for is good Torx head screws, preferably two on the top and maybe two on the, to mount it to the base. And, um, so th th those have more of like a, is that a more of a parkerized look? Is that cheaper finish or those have three? Yeah, so the premium rings have three on each side. Mm -hmm. They have the two recoil lugs on the bottom that wow. are squared off. That's pretty cool. And those remind me a little bit of the really cheap Vortex. Vortex has a cheap ring still that's like got the three, six screws on top. Yep. yep. Um, and I've had tons of sets of those. I never had a problem. Are they heavy? Are they bulky? Yeah, but do they work? A little bit yeah. on the bigger side. But I mean, here's the thing, though. I mean, it's, um, like I said, the, you can see machining marks on them. I, yes, for sure. Um, they are Chinesium, but very solid. I've had these on a lot of the guns. Um, like I said, if you don't care about how it looks, they're awesome rings. Uh, they're really, really awesome rings for the money. Yeah, there's there's a couple other companies that I've found, and I can't remember all the Listen, names of them. It's better than any but... of the crap that you find at Walmart, for sure, at half the price. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let's not lie. I mean... The OEM for like 90% of these are probably the same. And they're all coming from the same places. They're just putting, you know, maybe doing QC and changing. Well, they make their own rings. Monstrum has their own. Do they machines. really? They do their own stuff. And now actually they're going to, they brought in uh, uh, CNC machines to the United States. So they're going to do a bunch of rings mm -hmm. made in the U.S. Do they do rings for other companies or is that kind of? It is possible they do them for other companies. So I would think probably, but. <laughs> Well, I suppose I mean, like the Element Optics rings, I mean, Element doesn't make them themselves. I'm sure mm -hmm. they're taking somebody's rings and then pricing them higher. So, yeah, it, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion. Hey. Now, the, the scopes that uh, they have, um, they have scopes that uh, come with rings. Those rings are garbage. Uh, those mm -hmm. rings are absolutely garbage. But uh, these rings are actually, the ones that you buy separately are actually quite good. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I will leave you a question, and then I'm going to use the restroom really quick. Um, okay, so here you go. Um, discussion point. Legit question for people. Dial elevation and hold for wind or dial everything. So me personally, I hold over pretty much everything. Um, unless I'm shooting at one known distance for an extended period of time, and then I'll actually do it. I would say probably... Past a thousand yards, I would actually start dialing in a little bit, or you hit the point where you need to both dial and hold over. Uh, so that's my answer, and then I will let you guys discuss this. I'm going to hide myself for a second. Uh, I guess I'll start. Uh, for me, it would be depending on if I'm just shooting long range, I'm dialing. If I'm in a match, and the range for me, if the ranges are under 800, I'll hold over uh, just because I'm shooting a six millimeter projectile. So I can see my vapor trail. But for more like my long range, my ELR, 
stuff, I dial all the time. I don't hold over for anything unless I, unless I'm completely, uh, out of elevation in my turfs. Yeah. I mean, I think from a, like, I, I, I tend to be a dialer, but that's like a personal preference for me. I think that most hunters holdovers faster, more effective, most PRS situations. I don't know if Derek would agree. He has more experience in it. Probably holding over is going to be faster, more effective. Um, when it comes to recreational long range shooting, I definitely dial elevation and I'll do a combination kind of, of wind holdover, you know, like maybe I'll hold over, maybe I'll dial wind. It kind of depends on the wind. Like if the wind's like dead, then I might just dial the wind because it might just be a little and it might stay consistent. But if it's gusting and you dial wind, you're going to be chasing your wind back and forth and you're never going to even hit your target. Um, for ELR type stuff, recreational that I've done just, you know, for fun, it's a combination of both because I'll literally potentially run out of, of holdover. So I'll have to dial and then maybe hold over as well. Um, but I, I, yeah, it's kind of a personal preference thing a little bit though, I think. For wind, I prefer to hold, uh, regard, regardless, but for, like I said, for competition purposes, for like PRS NRL style matches, I uh, will try to do a holdover. Most of the time I do dial. Um, if it's anything over 800 yards, then I, I just instantly go to dial for myself. Uh, long range competitions. Uh, like the one I have coming up in June out in Wyoming, I'll probably be dialing most of that one. I won't hold over at all because I'm going to be shooting my 300 PRC at that competition. <laughs> so, I, actually, that one's not too far from your neck of the woods that we're going to. Oh, I didn't even hear about it. What is it or where is it at? Uh, the Night Force ELR Challenge. Oh, uh, Casper? Yep. Yeah, you'll drive basically right by my house probably. You'll have to stop yep. by or something. Um, yeah, that uh, I actually. So that that's a is that more of a ELR or PRS style competition? Um, you know, or, I don't know. I'm I'm I've been watching to watch other people's videos on it and everything, and it, everything is prone. So not so I don't want to say it's like PRS, but you're shooting at you have three different distances and you have to use so many rounds per target. Or you have you're allotted so many rounds to get to, eat, to get through each target. So yeah, it's going to be interesting I, on on how it's, it's going to be played out. It kind of seemed like so I ha I did read like one article I think on it, and it kind of seemed more like almost like a like a hybrid ELR or something like kind of between ELR and yeah. PRS or something like that. But it's I think it's a really popular match, and maybe one day I'll do it. I don't think I'll be able to get things together. Mail you never know this year, but I. I, uh, I definitely heard about it. Um, yeah, I'm two hours, I'm about two hours now, not even probably an hour and a half from it. Um, yeah. but, uh, so like I said, I'm going to be shooting my 300 PRC at that match mm -hmm. just because you'll be engaging targets from, uh, what what was about 400 yards. They were saying out to 2,100. So I, I, 2,100, I think is what I heard too, as far as the longest, yeah. uh, be ready for wind. I'm sure you already are cause where you live, but man, Casper is. It's a dry, windy place. It's gonna be. It's gonna be windy. I bet. Oh, some of the videos I was watching. Some of the other guys um, shooting at it. Man, hold a metric shit ton of wind. <laughs> I yeah. Literally, I there was one. One guy said he was holding ten mils of wind on an eight hundred yard shot. I uh, I was shooting recreationally only at like sixteen hundred yards in Gillette, which is kind of similar. And the crosswind was so bad that I was like gonna run out of windage adjustment. <laughs> like, cause I was, I was yeah. trying to dial, which was stupid because it was gusting. So you, like I said, the biggest mistake and that I've made, right. Is if you dial wind and especially if it's gusting, you're just like chasing what? it and you'll never going to hit your target. You're just going to keep chasing it. So hold, though. hold your wind and then adjust your hold to what you see. Cause especially when wind can change really quickly and mm -hmm. uh, even can change directions, especially out West. So, yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, we could uh, we could um, go to my local range and shoot out to like 840 and shoot a little video if you wanted or something on okay. your way through. Just All right. So yeah, we'll see what's going on. We've been going on for over two hours and 40 minutes. So we're going to take this one question yeah. and then we're going to 
end it from this point because apparently I was supposed to go walk our dog a couple hours ago. <laughs> uh, all right. You can only end while my battery charged up a little bit and we can end it on a good camera note. Uh, but immediately, as soon as I'm done here, I'll be ordering extra batteries for this camera as well. All right. You can only keep one scope for all your guns to share. Which one would you keep? They're like kids. I can't. I can't. You got to love them all. Yeah. I, I... <laughs> You know, just because I've had a lot of good luck with it, I'm going to say Which my Black Elephant Titan. No, my Elephant Titan. <laughs> I would say that... Well, okay, ho, 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 ho. Have to hey, I've gotten out to 1.2 miles with that scope. That's it. So, Is it one scope that we currently have, or one scope that we have oh in our collection, or one scope that we would actually spend our own money on? I, I'm thinking we got one a, scope we currently have. Yeah, because there's too many out there. <laughs> yeah. So one scope you currently have. And for me, I currently have the Element Titan on my 300 PRC, and I've shot 1.2 miles with it. And I've had really good luck with that scope. Uh, even on the 6.5 Creedmoor, I had really good luck with that scope. So that'd be my one scope. Okay. Steven? Oh man, I don't know if I do this because I come from the hunting and the recreational long range. So like, man, that's two totally different things. Okay, Razor, hunting. L LHT. Oh well, for hunting, yeah, it'd be the LHT four to what four point four to four point five to twenty two power one. The but for 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 everything else, I'd probably I, I haven't really tested it enough yet. But I, actually, the Vortex Gen two, the uh, Razor Gen two, is really I'm really feeling good about that scope. I like some of the features on that Gen three better. But that Gen two would be would be up there, I think, with me. Are you gonna do a video of Gen two versus Gen three? I've done a tabletop video with like features okay. versus features. We're gonna do a on the range video at some point okay. this year. Okay. Uh, so for me, it's easy. Uh, Loophole Mark V HD. Even though the reticle I have in mind sucks ass, it's the standard one. Um, <laughs> the second choice. I mean, it's weird. I understand the Element Titan. I think it's really, really good overall value for the money. I could live without it. Uh, actually, I could probably live without all my scopes. With, well, well, <laughs> I would need one of them. Um, but there's not one in particular that basically screams, this is an amazing scope. Um, I would probably say still the uh, Leupold Mark V HD because I think it has the best turrets in my mind. I think once the Burris Pro comes that would be you know what actually my ideal wish list would be a loophole <laughs> mark 5 hd with a burris scr2 reticle and that would be the chinese amazing. manufacturer they'll make it for you and honorable <laughs> honorable mention is, is my I, honorable mention my athlon aries etr and my chronos i like as well um but uh there's so many scopes out there i mean yeah. how do you how do you make Wow, Drew, really? <laughs> if cost was not an issue, I'll go for a C-130 Hercules gunship. I get 12 miles of almost vertical coverage. <laughs> I'd probably get a tangent theta. That, never mind. He, that just went over his head. <laughs> um. <laughs> tangent, fe tangent theta would be good. If money wasn't an issue? Yes. Look, look oh, at Drew's comment. Okay. If... Oh, if money wasn't an issue, I'd have an s &B. Oh yeah, well, the new Smith Bender six to thirty six. I thought we were talking about scopes though, not ships. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, one more, one more, one okay. more, one more. Oh god! Do any of you retorque your scope after a certain period of time? I assume the lugs mm. loosen at some point. I never use Loctite initially. Every every match, I check my torques. I. I uh, use Loctite on the base screw to the Picatinny rail, not on the ring screws. I do um, check torque occasionally, uh, but to actually really only from like a hunting perspective. Um, I've noticed with extreme temperature fluctuations, like if I'm hunting at negative 20 degrees and then I, I'm shooting at 70 plus degrees or something, I have had, the only problems I've had is it hasn't been on my target guns. It hasn't been on my precision guns so much. It's been on my hunting guns that get beat around a lot. 
and uh, put through like really weird weather. Um, and I have had a couple of times without Loctite that I have problems, which why I put Loctite now. Um, and uh, I will check them sometimes pre-season, basically. I, once season's going, I don't check them, but pre-season I do. Okay. All right. And I feel I'm sorry that I neglected the people, but there are people actually watching on Odyssey, but there were no mm. questions. So, uh, like I said, the Odyssey numbers don't show up on the software that we're streaming with right now. Uh, yes, I will. So going into like something that's like a mission critical type environment, I would recheck everything. Um, I mean, that's why in my kit, I, I have a small fix it sticks kit, which has torque <coughs> limiters and a torque driver. So I would verify everything is in place before you go shoot it. Um, it's the same thing. So like when I did a lot of handgun matches, you would verify all the magazines are clean. You would verify um, the sights are still in place. They didn't come loose, things like that. Um, I mean, I think it's just general good practice. Um, on a regular gun, eh, just if it's not mission critical, it's like whatever. <laughs> Do you use uh, uh, Loctite on your Picatinny base to receiver? Base to receiver, yes. Okay. Yes. Depending on the gun. Uh, so if I'm going to futz around with it later, um, depending on the screw, so there's quite a few of them that came from the factory that had a little bit of Loctite. Trying to, and because we use cheap screws, so let's say, oh, for example, if you did like something like a Torx 10, um, instead of like a 15, it's very mm -hmm. easy to strip those out. So pretty mm -hmm. much in a lot of those cases, because of the Loctite, I ended up having to drill them out because the, even the I... extractors wouldn't work. So I verify the torque, but I generally I... don't use Loctite yeah. unless I have to. If you're gonna have a, real quick, if you're gonna have a gun that you're gonna use a lot for hunting and you're gonna shoot it a lot, I would I would personally use blue Loctite on the base to the, the the base to receiver screws, but you want yeah like you have to be careful not to over torque or strip out the heads like you do not want to screw up your torque on those screws. All the other ones you could screw up and not be in as much trouble basically. Yeah. You don't want to screw up, but uh, I have had when like your receiver gets really hot. I've had ones that were torqued down without Loctite and they were okay. torqued correctly, come completely like loose over time. So oh yeah, for sure. So uh, I use I Loctite from my from my scope base onto my action. And once that scope's on there, if your base goes loose, you have to take your scope off, tighten it back down, you have to re-zero it most of the time. That's another reason I like to make sure that's really not going to move around. Okay, so actually, I like, had a comment along the same topic. My Savage Rifles, I have to Loctite the bases that kept coming loose. Uh, Mr. Savage Person, is that your experience as well? I have had that experience with some of the older savages. A lot of the newer ones I haven't um, had that issue with. Now, go watch my video I did on the Vergaras, because with the Vergara, you use a 700-style base. So what I do is I put a little bit of Loctite underneath the base, and I put it down there because it, uh, it seals up that air gap. Yeah, um, wire. I definitely recommend go watch my video I did on that one. And I do that on all my Savages now also. So even if they're brand new, they come from the factory for review, I'll pull the base off, put the Loctite on the bottom, put it down, torque it down, and let it set for like 24 hours. That way it encloses that air gap between the scope base and the action. I would also, and I'm sure, and I know you guys do it, but uh, for those that don't know, clean the, uh, the holes and the threads on the screw itself. Uh, with like isopropyl alcohol or something before and let it dry before you put the Loctite on. That way you don't have like oil getting in there or anything like that. Yep. Yeah, this is, I mean, it is the same comment. Like if it's mission critical and I guess also like if you're going to keep it and not make a lot of changes, I guess if you're a normal gun owner and you have your gun and you're going to put your set of rings and you're going to have the same optic, yeah, uh, Loctite what you need to. Um, I wouldn't necessarily Loctite the scope rings because I would probably take them off at some point or whatnot. Uh, but if your chance or probability of having to remove it is zero or close to it, yeah, Loctite it in place. Um, I generally don't because let's say, for example, we might get a gun and then I might have to, let's say, for example, Anarchy Outdoors says, hey, we have a new scope base that we want to test that mm -hmm. has a bubble level or this or that. If it's Loctited yeah. in there, there's a very good chance that when you try to take it off, you're going to end up stripping it and causing more problems. So that's why I don't in those cases. But if you're not, you better have 
uh, tools with you wherever you are in order to put them in place um, if you need to. I was re I was remiss anyways in what I said about loctiting the scope rings to the base. I only do loctite the base to the receiver actually because that's where the heat and, and changes in okay. temperature uh, seem to cause the most trouble. Um, I do check the ring tightness though occasionally, but um, you can you can't access that base. So if you have a designated hunting rifle and you're out on a hunt and it's fluctuating temperature and your base comes loose and you don't have tools, you're gonna have to recite everything, relevel your scope, and all, you might it can be a real pain. So you want to make sure that base yep. doesn't come loose. Yep. So there you go. There's your answer to do you put Loctite or not. Uh, so <clears> we had <throat> answers here. We had <throat> the peanut gallery as well, and I guess we actually started. This, I guess let's finish it up with kind of like how we started it. So I know you've all played it with the EP5 um, at SHOT Show. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? And then where can people find your channel? And damn, this thing is heavy. <laughs> okay. Actually, that, w uh, that was one of my thoughts. <laughs> um, okay, so I did look at look through the EP5. It was a nice scope. I did a video on it. You can go check it out on my channel at Northwest Guns. I uh, my initial thoughts on it for a six hundred dollar scope, I don't think it's going to be a bad deal. I think it's good for the money. Five fifty. Five is it? Five fifty. Well, okay. Five, under five forty nine with all of this goodness. This that it comes okay, with under six hundred dollars. I think it's going to be. It's it's going to put a dent in the market, but it's like I said, it's not a scope. I'm going to go pay with my own money. I might just because it is popular. And maybe to give them an honest try. I don't know. We'll see what the future chat holds. But you guys can reach me at Northwest Guns over on Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, uh, the Northwest Guns Facebook group. And you guys can catch me here on a lot of streams with these guys at times. Yep. So anyway, if you don't know my name, it's Stephen Bresnod. Bullets for Bucks. So Bullets for Bucks, all one word with the number four instead of the word four. So Bullets for Bucks is the YouTube channel, Facebook page, website. Um, if you really want to get a hold of me, uh, Facebook Messenger is a good way. Or just leave a comment on my YouTube channel. Um, I did play with the uh, Arkin. And I got to say, it, it did feel heavy. It felt bulky. Um, what impressed me was the tactile and audibleness of the turrets, as well as the zero stop feature. Um, basically, its feature set did, did impress me, uh, but not nearly as annoying as... No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no. So um, I, I would still probably go with like an Athlon scope because I don't know supply chain issues with Arkin, uh, longevity of Arkin as a company, uh, warranty, things like that. But from a feature set, uh, cost-effective perspective, with all the wings and everything, you, on paper, on paper, if they can deliver what they say they can deliver, and their sc scopes have good, consistent QC, the Arkin could not be beat right now by any other scope in its niche. That's that's that would be my opinion on it. Um, but uh, yeah, so what he right, what what he said. Um, <laughs> So basically, you know my take on it. Um, I think that there's, uh, for the money, all the features, I think it's terrific so far, first impressions. Uh, we'll have a couple of detailed videos on these in the near future. Um, I think if weight is not gonna be an issue, this is gonna be a good way to go. Um, if you're gonna be a little bit more weight sensitive, look, it's not my camera that went out for a change. Uh, if you're gonna be a little bit more weight sensitive, um, the SH4 Gen 2 might be a good option then uh but otherwise the ep5 it's it checks all the boxes let's put it that way it definitely checks all the boxes um and like i said i just hope that they get through their growing pains and actually start delivering or even not necessarily getting rid of all the qc issues but solving the customer service issues because if they if issues are going to pop up anyway absolutely issues will pop up it's how you deal with them and i'm hopeful that they will and that's gonna be really really good and then this scope it's going to be terrific for the money um, the only downside as i said i wish there was a shark fin uh, versus using a throw lever and if the reticle if the entire reticle was illuminated that would be awesome i box could be a little bit more forgiving but once again for the price you can't really complain 
and I think this is going to be, like I said, I think out of the Chinesium scopes, the one that's going to be in the toughest place, I feel bad for my people at Element because that Titan, it would be tough to recommend it versus this because they're both heavy pigs. Um, and like I said, these are going to be the same. This might even have better glass. So it'll be comparing it to that. So those are my thoughts. Uh, thank you guys for joining. For We've been on for three mm -hmm. hours now, which is nuts. Um, so I will actually, this replay will be out for a little bit. Then we're going to chop the video down. And you'll be able just to see just the first impressions on the scope and go from there. If there's questions or anything else you want to see in the review, um, leave them as a comment. And I will make sure to address those. Um, if you guys want to find more information on the scope, uh, there are links in the description box below. They are affiliate links. And if you do buy something, it will help the channel. Um, as always, uh, thank you guys for joining. Derek, Stephen, thank you guys for coming on the chat. And um, always, uh, always glad to have you guys' opinion. And thank you, channel members. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you for coming on. Thank you for supporting the channel. And if you're not a channel member, hit the join button below. And we'll see you guys very, very soon. And we'll have a whole bunch more SHOT Show videos coming up this week and more. Thank you, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night.